So first, uh, so let's start with this program. Uh, well, first, let me uh, welcome you to the, uh, the third SCLA Global Online Forum, which is the Chinese Swiss International Sports Arbitration Online Forum. And first, uh, first, I would like to wish you all your family and you stay in good health uh, during this pandemic. And uh, me and the SCLA are working on uh, both in the donations, continuous donations for the Global Fund and for other institutions to work for fighting with the coronavirus. And uh, please let me know if I can do anything help in China. C currently, I'm also in self-quarantine in China because I just traveled from Europe. I have been <laughs> an, <laughs> a week left. So, um, so on February 28, 2020, the Court of Arbitration for Sports announced the arbitration results of the previous World Out of 10 anti-doping agency the Chinese swimmer Sun Yang will be suspended uh, for eight years. Um, today, we are not only going to discuss this case, but also we're going to exchange uh, the uh, and the exchange and explore the laws behind the case, uh, which is the uh, sports arbitration. And please let me welcome all the speakers and uh, all of your participants from over eleven countries and regions, which are China. Hong Kong Special Administrative Region, Switzerland, Sweden, United Kingdom, Germany, France, United States, Bangladesh, and Netherlands. Uh, and, and the tradition of SCLA Global Webinar is to be interactive, meaning that you are extremely welcome to introduce yourself, bringing your idea and questions at any time. Uh, and during the presentations, please use the chat functions to type your question in the chat box which you can press ALT plus H, you can find the chat box. And you are more than welcome to share the documents to all participants in the chat, chat box as well by uploading the files. So first, let me introduce what is SCLA, what is the Swiss Chinese Law Association, and very briefly. So um, the values of the SCLA is to become a global community, a global platform, and a global voice for European, particularly Swiss and Asian, particularly Chinese lawyers, so um, the values of the SEO is the connections. The connections will be will be coming twofold. First, it locates in Geneva, Switzerland. We are going to con uh, connect it and promote a legal uh, collaboration among China, Switzerland, and European countries. The second fold of these connections of this value means that uh, Swiss Chinese Law Association also promotes the con connections with the international organizations. And uh, for example, SCLA has become been applying for the observer status of the United Nations Conference for Trade and Development, uh, uh, which will have more evolved engagements in the decision making process, and uh, uh, it will be approved in 2021. So the visions of SCLA is to have twofold as well. So one, as I said, as a global voice for legal, com uh, one is the we we hope these connections will bring a more transparent, integrated uh, global legal market by uh, reducing the transactional costs between Europeans and the Asian countries. Uh, so that uh, <laughs> an open platform, rather, we have in a closed cycle and uh, we have the, uh, the member lead actions and uh, we, which we can enable, uh, make it possible to, um, uh, to, uh, to connect, uh, connect with each other and to uh, make it as a, um, uh, uh, as a global platform. And the second is uh, we hope to become a global voice for the legal communities in the decisional making process, international decision making process. For example, we have been uh, engaged in a lot of conference and policy making uh, uh, process within the United Nations. So what is the figures of SCLA? So since its establishment, SCLA has established one friendly with a lot of institutions uh, it's a young association, but it's developed in a uh, quite quite well way, and uh, um, it, it, we have a lot of member lead actions. So we have over 90 members from six different countries across different sectors, including law firms from different sectors, such as um, also the judicial sectors uh, and private com companies. And we have also not five, I think now it's 10 members from different international organizations, including myself. I uh, have been working for the United Nations uh, for the uh, International Law Commission as a consultant. Um, so the actions, what, the, what, what does SCLA do? So the first is we promote a kind of common standard of legal practice so that to promote a more reliable and trustworthy, um, 
a more transparent legal market uh, in different in different sectors, and it is completely open. It is completely, let's say, members driven. This project, they we are starting to negotiate to discuss what is like some values that both Chinese and Swiss lawyers are uh, more are uh, jointly recognized. And the, the second is the global presence. As I said, we are applying for the observer status of UNCTAD. Uh, and the thirdly is a new project which we started uh, uh, two weeks ago with um, uh, regarding the uh, launch the center of proof of foreign law. So uh, this this project uh, uh, is also with uh, Professor Ibo is also joining with us today. So uh, you are more welcome to discuss uh, with him and uh, uh, later and uh, welcome him to share some ideas in the in the chat box as well. So the center of proof of uh, foreign law uh, it will be established in Nanjing province, Nanjing city, which is a very nice city located in the Jiangsu province. So it will not enable the Chinese institutions, courts, and law firms to find out the foreign law impartially with reduced cost, but it will facilitate the academic research between education institutions and professional institutions. So it's jointly held with Nanjing City Municipality and Southeast University. And we are welcome for lawyers and the law firms to join this initiative. Uh, let's say how we can work, how we can go further to uh, to make this China, make China to connect to the world to understand more about foreign laws because law itself is uh, geographically restricted, right? So the lawyers within a certain country, the practice uh, has the geographic boundaries. So why don't we connect to each other? And that is also the idea why we have the uh, center of proof of foreign law. And also the last one is the uh, Swiss Chinese Law Review. We are um, uh, currently uh, led by a colleague uh, working in the coronavirus issue. So this is the locations. Uh, we provide great coffee and delicious food for your visit uh, and for free if you are anytime welcome to join us uh, for uh, uh, for uh, delicious Chinese food, by the way. So, uh, sorry for missing. So uh, that is the um, uh, the about ourselves. So I have three minutes left. What I wish to, to, to do uh, is I I wish to um, wish to go over this list uh, so that uh, people can introduce themselves in a in a quick in a quick way and uh, um, uh, please uh, it, could you re uh, could you um, introduce yourself uh, in one or two sentences who you are what do you work and uh, uh, in ten seconds so first on my list is Mr. Peter uh, Flavio Flavio Peter are you there yes I'm here can you hear me yes good my name is Flavio Peter I'm a um, counsel at Wenger and Vialli. We're a Zurich and Sug based Swiss law firm and I specialize in uh, commercial arbitration. So I'm not as familiar with the sports arbitration world. That's why I'm joining today and look forward to hear uh, and learn a lot of new stuff. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, Mr. Michael Walgreen. Are you there, Mr. Uh, Michael? Maybe he's uh, has not, uh, he will join us maybe later. So um, uh, next, Mr. Uh, Tan Yao Wen. Hello, Mr. Tan. Okay, so, um, uh, so we'll come back later. So uh, next one is uh, Miss Victoria uh, Tibet, 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 sorry, sorry for my. That's quite um, all right. I constantly get that. I'm Victoria Tsvetanova, joining you from the UK, from Dentons. And I work in the field of sport with the particular aspect of competition law. Um, so less on anti doping, but that's why I'm here as well. Find out more. Okay. So next one is Mr. Wang Xiaoping from China. Are you there, Mr. Xiaoping? Yes, uh, my name is Wang, Wang Xiaoping. Uh, I'm a, a partner of the uh, Grand Law Law Firm in China. I'm located in Beijing. Uh, my specific field is uh, international investment, international trade, and also the uh, intellectual property and the financing. Uh, eventually, I'm a just have been the Lausanne last uh, January. 
uh, I eventually hop in the Olympic uh, Museum there. <laughs> anyway, okay. I'm a little bit, uh, uh, you know, interesting in such uh, sports arbitration. Eventually, I'm uh, uh, in charge of some uh, litigation uh, and arbitration, uh, but uh, not yet in the sports arbitration. Uh, uh, Thank you very much, Mr. Shafi. Yeah. And uh, we will stop here and uh, uh, and we will come back to introduce ourselves in the uh, break. So uh, uh, please let me firstly welcome Mr. Wu Ming, partner at Zhonglin Law Firm Shanghai office. Uh, he will bring up um, a discussion regarding the case brief and insights Chinese from a Chinese perspective in the Sun, about the Sun Yang case. Uh, and uh, Mr. Wu Ming specializes in international commercial arbitration and international sports arbitration. Mr. Wu Ming is one of the few Chinese lawyers who have practiced practical experience in sports arbitration before FIFA, Dispute Resolution Committee, Basketball Arbitral Tribunal, and Court of Arbitration Sports. So your time is yours, Mr. Mi. Okay, uh, uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Zhang. Uh, my name is Wu Ming, a partner at Zhonglun Law Firm Shanghai office. And uh, today, thanks uh, Swiss Chinese Law Association for organizing this fantastic event. And uh, let me share my uh, point of view on the case Vada versus Sun Yang and uh, Fina before cast. I wish this event a great success. So I'm not, now I'm going to share my uh, PPT. With... OK, now uh, you can see that's my uh, PowerPoint. So the, my, um, the topic of my uh, speech today is the, uh, about the case brief and uh, insight from a Chinese lawyer's perspective. Okay, so today I will have around 10 minutes to give my speech, which, I will, be, uh, which will be split into two parts. Part one will be, I will brief this case and in introducing the factual background and uh, uh, folks of dispute. And in part two, I will share my um, thoughts on this case, like uh, what kind of lessons we can learn from this case. Okay, so now let's uh, uh, look, look back, you know, what happened in 2014. Okay, according to the athlete, because of an issue with his heart, he would faint after uh, some training sections. So in 2014, the athlete's doctor made a mistake and uh, prescribed to him a banned substance to, to treat that issue. Okay. He, uh, and and as an, as an uh, consequence, so the, the, the athlete tested doping positive and uh, as a result, he received a three months period of ineligibility. So apparently that athlete already committed his first anti-doping rule violation in 2014. Okay. And does it matter? Yes, because according to the FINA doping control rules, if an athlete commits his, his second anti-doping rule violation, then the period of ineligibility will be doubled, which means a four year period of ineligibility will become eight year ban. So, and uh, as a rule, the arbitral panel has no discretion in this issue, okay? And then we move to the uh, event uh, of 4th September, 2018. What happened on that evening? So on the evening of 4th September, uh, 20, 2018, you can see that FINA authorized the IDTM to collect, to collect blood and uh, urine samples from the athlete. So this, is, this was an out of competition sample collection mission. So three persons from IDTM carried out the mission. They are a female doping control officer, we call it DCO, a female blood collection assistant, DCA and a male do doping control assistant, DCA. So in the beginning, the athlete signed the doping control form and the corporate in providing two blood samples 
So these samples were sealed in a glass containers and stored in the storage box. Shortly thereafter, the athlete discovered that the DCA had taken pictures of him. So the, the athlete asked to check the credential of the DCA and then found that both the DCA and the BCA did not have individual authorization letter from either FINA or IDTM. So then, then the athlete demand, demanded to remove the blood samples. The BCO took the glass containers from the storage box and handed them to the athlete. The athlete assisted a security guard to break the glass container and took the blood further out. The blood version remained, remained intact but was kept by the athlete. The athlete also tore the doping control form that he had previous, previously signed. So there is the uh, very uh, brief uh, factual background of this case. And then we uh, look at the argument on the interpretation of Article 5.3.3 of the International Standard of Testing and uh, Investigations. Okay. So now, how to interpret this article is the most important issue of this case. But unfortunately, CARS disagreed with the athlete interpretation on this article and concluded that the generic letter of authority issued by FINA to IDTM is sufficient. And so the DCO, DCA, and BCA did not require a specific and individual authorization letter mentioning their names individually. And Cass also found that the DCO at that night had already given warning about the consequences of, the, of a failure to comply to, to the athlete though the athlete might not have paid attention to that warning. Okay. Then, so finally the CAS um, conclusion is that the athlete hadn't had a compelling justice, a compelling justification to fail to comply with the sample collection process and the consequently violated the Article 2.5 of FINA doping control rules, which is a tempering violation. So as this is the second violation, because we just mentioned in 2014, the athlete committed his first violation. So this is the second violation. So the athlete was banned for eight years. Okay. So as a high profile case, people have lots of discussion on it. So as a Chinese lawyer, um, I'd like to uh, share my thought on what you know, um, we uh, as a whole can learn from this case very uh, generally. First, uh, first, it's for the athlete. Okay. So it's prudent that the athlete complies with the direction of a doping control officer and provides samples in every case. So if the athlete has any objection to the entire process, he or she can still, you know, uh, cooperate to conduct the, the, the sample collection uh, and uh, under protest by recording his objection, complaints, or any comments on the doping control uh, form or through any other method, methods. Okay, this is the uh, thoughts of, for athlete. And uh, for, for uh, China Anti-Doping Agency, you know, I think, you know, Chanada promotes the culture of zero tolerance with anti-doping violations. Okay. As we can see uh, in this, you know, uh, uh, aspect, there is much space to improve with Chanada. And uh, for Chinese uh, fitness before international arbitral tribunal, so, uh, my thought is or advice is that, you know, um, and because we can see the performance of Chinese witnesses in close examination in this case can be said as a, a nightmare. But I would not blame the 
of witnesses. On the contrary, as a Chinese lawyer, I can understand why their performance was, was so bad. The reasons include culture difference, the way Eastern people defending themselves are different from the way that people, you know, Western people, and uh, not, fam uh, familiars, not familiar with the, the adversarial trial process, like accusing and defending, etc. So therefore, the, the, the preparation and the practice are very important for Chinese witness. So for example, the witness must be very familiar with his or her written testimony previously submitted to the arbitral panel. So when he or she answers questions, he or she should stick to his or her testimony. So otherwise, his or her credibility will be impaired. So that's the thing that happened to those Chinese witnesses you know, in this case. And we also uh, uh, look at the uh, Chinese media. This case has caught massive attention of Chinese media. When we look back what happened with Chinese uh, media in the past one and a half year, we can see uh, that a 180 degree re reverse as to media's attitude toward the athlete on or after 4th um, March 2020, the day on which the cast released its uh, full decision document on this case. Okay. So the reason I think is that because, you know, it's for the first time that the Chinese media had the a chance to read a different version of a story from a party besides the, the athlete. Okay. So there is, um, um, I think there is much space to improve, you know, as to the, to the uh, professional, pro professionality of Chinese sport media. And finally, we go to uh, the topic of the globalization of Chinese sports industry. I believe that uh, a, a positive effect of this high profile case is that it will, it will definitely will enhance people's awareness of and speed up the globalization of Chinese sport industry. So at first people will take this opportunity to introspect uh, how we deal with sports rules, including laws of game, disciplinary code, anti-doping rules, and even the procedural rules of sports um, arbitration. But do we, do, do we really understand these rules? You know, without doubt, you know, only after we can uh, uh, interpret the rules precisely and uh, confidently, then we can uh, utilize these rules to gain and protect our uh, interests. So the second uh, aspect of the globalization is um, of a sports industry. It's about the business mode and the market scale. We, we will need to learn how to um, operate and manage the sport intellectual property. For example, in 2014, uh, NBA signed a nine-year television sport broadcasting contract with three American national TV networks, which is ABC, ESPN, and TNT, um, at a price up to 24 billion US dollar. So NBA is paid 2.7 billion annually for its TV broadcasting, broadcasting. So as a comparison, CBA can only get 50 million US dollar per year from its TV broadcasting deal. So the TV broadcasting price difference between NBA and CBA reaches 54 times. So you can see there's a, a long way to go. Okay, um, that's, that's what I, um, what I um, uh, uh, like to share with you today, the factual background, folks of the uh, uh, dispute and uh, some thoughts on this case. Thank you, thank you again for Swiss um, um, and, and Chinese Law Association and thanks for, for you guys uh, uh, spend time to uh, listen to me, thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Wu. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Peter asked, could you uh, quickly elaborate who were the witnesses uh, when hearing this case? You, you are asking me? Yes. Okay. The witness, the, uh, uh, the, witness um, the, uh, the, the number one witness is uh, the, the athlete, because the athlete, you know, in the international sport arbitration, he can, uh, at the same time, he can be an, uh, an witness. So he's the number one witness. And the second one is his doctor, Mr. Ba Zhen, 
who um, who um, should I, I think should take the responsibility for the athletes the first uh, doping uh, rule violation you know? and the third witness is um, is uh, is a leader uh, of the Chinese swimming um, team you know the national swimming team is a leader uh, who who is, he is the person that you know that night the athlete called to. And the fourth witness is the uh, is, uh, is, um, is, is a deputy uh, leader or some some is a, is someone that who uh, in charge of the uh, Zhejiang Province uh, anti doping uh, agency. So he is uh, at that night the athlete and Mr. Ba, Dr. Ba also call to the witness number the fourth witness for. Uh, like you know, uh, asking for his um, opinion on uh, what the rule, the anti-doping rule, should be uh, interpreted. And uh, the the fifth um, 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 witness of the the athlete is uh, is Shenyang's uh, mother. Um, uh, and uh, the the last one witness is the is an uh, expert on China, China law, uh, Professor Pei Yang. So that's that's the witness of the uh, of the athlete, and and uh, in this case, if I yeah. sorry, if I may quickly ask, I understood you saying that those witnesses uh, testified and they uh, malperformed in a sense; they did not perform very yeah very good in front of the tribunal. Did I understand you correctly? Yes, yes, you, you are correct. Okay. That's what I'm talking that, about. That's why I was asking. I wasn't quite yeah. sure who the witnesses were. I understand. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Wumi. And can you explain why there, were, there was a change in the Chinese media? What do you think that and before before release of uh, judgment and after the religion release of judgment, why there was a radical change regarding the athlete? I think I think that is a, a topic that is very uh, sensitive, you know, in China. You know, actually, um, people don't want to, you know, talk too much about that. You know, criticizing the uh, professional ability of the uh, Chinese sport media. They they done their job very well. But you know, when we're talking about uh, 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 specifically, you know, uh, on this case, you know, last year, year I had uh, uh, I, I wrote two articles on this case, you know, for. Like for uh, like talking about what will happen, you know, in the in the cars trial, what you know, something like that, you know, very uh, professional analyze on this, but you know, but uh, but from the uh, perspective of the sports media, they mainly they only listen to what the athlete uh, talking about, you know, uh, what the athletes uh, uh, social media, you know, what the athlete released on uh, his social media and uh, and uh, and the media you know chinese sport media trust you know the the athlete very much and kind of you know they do not want to or or they are unable to read you know uh, the materials from uh, the 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 from uh, english language or or from different uh, you know source you know they rely they to, they rely on single source too much so uh, after fourth march and uh, they have the chance to read the, the 48 pages, you know, the full decision, which disclose lots of facts, lots of uh, uh, arguments, you know, not to analyze this reasoning. So they, they, then they have the chance to sit down and, 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 and think, you know, what, what, what is the truth? You know? I think that why they uh, have, a, have, a, have a change, a very significant change. Okay, great. Thank you, Mr. Wu Ming, and um, uh, thank you for for your introduction of the case. I think it's a uh, it's great for uh, for to re uh, to look back what was happening uh, in last year November. What was the uh, what uh, what the what is the case? And it's great to to know. And uh, uh, it's great to, like to from uh, we we get now from the Chinese side of how was the uh, idea of these cases? What was the media reactions and uh, how was uh, how was the different opinions from uh, from side and how do uh, like people or like say a representative Chinese lawyers think about the uh, the, um, the 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 CAS? So uh, now we, let's go in, uh, give our uh, uh, give our uh, uh, stage to the uh, to our uh, Swiss colleagues uh, with uh, Mr. Uh, Philip Vladimir Boss. 
Uh, he's going to discussing in the um, in the uh, anti-doping environment mapping and who was the players and the uh, stakeholders. And uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Philip uh, Vladimir Bos is um, is partner at uh, Bianchi Watt, and he was a former clerk at the uh, Federal Criminal Court of Switzerland. His practice areas including money laundering, bribery, and uh, fraud cases. Ms. Philip Vladimir Boss uh, advises and appears before various jurisdictions in sports-related matters. He specifically uh, advises inter international federations and officials in sports integrity issues. Now, time is yours, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Philip. Try to share my screen. If I may. Yes, please. Um, how can I do that? Oh, yes, here it is. Yes. So, thank you very much. My name is Philippe Boss. I'm a Swiss based lawyer in, in Lausanne. I'm in my office today, even though usually I work from home, but today I'm in my office. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. As you, as you said, um, as a originally a criminal lawyer, I also assist uh, uh, international federations in the field of sports, uh, mainly those based in Lausanne, uh, mostly in, in disciplinary cases or in, or in matters of contracts. And I also uh, appeared very often in front of the Swiss Federal Tribunal uh, after CAS awards. So um, as we have had a very interesting um, uh, remarks from our Chinese colleagues, you will have seen that many different um, entities are named and the idea of my introduction before I give the floor to my uh, Swiss estimated colleagues Valoni and, and Moran, who will get into more details, was that I would give just a mapping of the different stakeholders and just give a bit of a who's who, which might, uh, which might be helpful for, for, for you. Uh, of course, I understand that uh, we have a different um, expertise in, in, in the field of sports for so for some of the so for some of you um, this presentation will be very um, basic for, for others I hope it is helpful so um, basically um, yeah yes so um, I will um, as I said, make a mapping of those uh, stakeholders and, and straight after that, uh, always make a direct reference to the Sunyang case so that we can place each of those stakeholders both generally and specifically in the Sunyang case, which is uh, an award which you can find if you're interested on, on the website of the Court of Arbitration Sports. So um, starting now with WADA and the WADA code, um, so WADA, the World Anti-Doping Agency, based uh, in Lausanne, but with, with headquarters in, in Canada, in Montreal. Um, it might be useful to say that it is based on uh, the cooperation, let's say, of both governments, on the one hand, but also the Olympic movement, which makes that they both together uh, represent uh, the World Anti-Doping Agency, uh, each of them through different bodies in a rather complex structure, but each of them with 18 members, they together uh, form the foundation board of the World Anti-Doping Agency, which um, you can see is based on the WADA statutes. All those, all those references in blue are of course those you can click on uh, and, and find the, the, the example on, on the internet. Um, so this is uh, something you see in the, in the, in the Sunyang case, it, it clearly says that WADA's aim is to promote and coordinate the fight against doping in sports internationally. So WADA's aim is not to enforce it at first. The, the, the task to enforce uh, uh, the World Anti-Doping Code at first lies on other bodies, but of course WADA will be there to have a, a global a coordination and, and enforce it in the last resort where necessary and which is uh, what happened in the Sunyang case. So for example, going back to how uh, WADA is representative of the sports world as regards uh, the Olympic movement, the Olympic movement 
itself brings its 18 members through different bodies, which are, well, sorry for uh, very barbaric acronyms for those of you that are not familiar with them, but IOF, which is the association of the Winter Sports Federation at the Olympic Games, ANOC, which is the association of the National Olympic Committees, ASWAF, which is the association of the Summer Olympic International Federations, GAIS, which is another association of international sports, but not limited to Olympic sports. Um, the IOC Athletes Commission, which is where athletes would have more impact uh, on, on, on WADA and its structure. Uh, the IOC itself, of course, and the IPC, which is the International Paralympic Committee. So all those uh, entities will then, through their own um, internal um, representations and elections, bring uh, those individuals uh, to the foundation board which will then give some representation to the very vast and diverse uh, sporting world or olympic movement let's say so this is a bit to give um, the the idea of how uh, representative water is this is just a tiny note on the budget uh, in 2018 water had a 35 thousand uh, thirty five million dollars budget and you will see that it's equally sourced by both the uh, public authorities and and the Olympic movement um, so WADA is responsible for enacting a series of documents which we will see here of course the WADA code this is the first uh, document which is uh, the most the first and, and more, more, more important document to uh, to talk about uh, upon a broad consultation, it is not here that we will discuss how those documents are enacted, but it requires all those stakeholders that we, we mentioned before to be integrated in the consultation towards uh, the enactment of those uh, of the WADA code. Um, and then the international standards. Uh, we will see one of those which is very important in the, in the Sunyang case, but um, those international standards are more practical rules that are meant to uh, to understand and implement the WADA code, such as the international standard for testing and investigations called ISTI, which is the one that will be discussed and was, was a debate in the Sunyang case, but also other international standards such as um, the IS for results management, the IS for therapeutic use exemption, exemptions, TUE, which is uh, those procedures where an athlete can act to, uh, can request to be uh, exempted from, from any violation in case he takes some, uh, some specific drugs for medical reasons mainly. Um, the international standard for the protection of privacy and personal information, this is data protection. Another standard for education, uh, a standard for code compliance for signatories. This is very relevant in, in the Russian, uh, Russian saga where we see whether or not uh, a signatory, so for example, a national anti-doping agency is compliant with the code or not. Uh, and as well, the international standards on the prohibited list, which we list all the drugs that are uh, being prohibited. And WADA also enact, enacts uh, guidelines which are recommended practices, and we'll see in the Sunyan case that this, this was also discussed. Um, so, um, as we mentioned before, the WADA code is, has some specific signatories, so uh, entities that sign the WADA code and are, that are bound to enforce it, which is, of course, WADA itself, the IOC, so the International, International Olympic Committee, which will be uh, in charge of uh, doing the testing during uh, or on the occasion of the Olympic Games, but also the international federations, the International Para Paralympic Committee, the National Olympic Committees themselves, uh, Paralympic Committees, major events organizers, and the na national uh, anti-doping uh, agencies. So I put here Lionel Messi, <laughs> signing something, but uh, he's not a signatory to the, to the WADA code. So players themselves are not signatories to the WADA code. What the, uh, the players uh, come under the let's say, jurisdiction of, of the World Anti-Doping Program because whenever they enter uh, a competition or whenever they are licensed by, for example, an international federation, 
then they commit to respect those rules uh, governing um, uh, anti-doping. But they are not directly um, signatories to the WADA code uh, themselves. So these signatories that we mentioned, WADA, the IOC, um, uh, the National Anti-Doping Agency, they must implement the, the WADA code through their own rules. So the WADA code is not directly um, enforceable in these cases. Um, but to the contrary, the international standards are mandatory and directly applicable. So this is something we could, can see also in the Suyong case where there was, on the one hand, the WADA code would not apply directly. It would be the, the, the FINA anti-doping regulation that would apply, which is, of course, a copy-paste of the WADA code. But then the ISTI, the International Standard on Testing and Investigation, which would be mandatory and directly applicable. Um, this is what we find here as references to the Sunyang case. So the number you see on the, on the left is, is the number of the paragraph, which you can find if you look through, the, through this case. So the applicable regulation is the FINA uh, doping uh, code, which is, as I said, copy-paste of, of WADA, and the ISTI, which is uh, for itself directly uh, applicable. This is the, the paragraph of, of the ISTI, which was discussed before and which was highly debated um, in the case, whether or not they needed some more specific authorization or whether those uh, anti-doping officials uh, or sample collection personnel uh, could just rely on a more generic authorization. This was a debate, so you see that the ISTI was directly applicable and debated. Um, and here, sorry for the upper part does not have the, the number, but it's a part of the testimony of one of the witnesses, which was uh, uh, WADA's official, where, which said, and which was uh, accepted by CAS, they say that uh, the panel does not dispute Mr. Kemp's testimony and fully adheres to his logic that WADA's guidelines are not binding. So this is relevant, as we, we mentioned before, WADA code, international standards, guidelines, those guidelines will help people understand how it works, but it's not binding, uh, binding source of law. Um, so who tests who? That is also a, an interesting question because as we saw before, there are many signatories and, and we, we want to know who does, who does what in, this, um, in these circumstances. Um, so basically, in a very basic fa fashion, uh, international federations will test international athletes, so those that participate to international competitions, and national anti-doping agencies will test national athletes. So in the FINA, in the, in the Sunyang case, of course, Mr. Uh, Mr. Sunyang is an international athlete, reason why he was uh, tested um, by FINA. Major event organizers will, will also test athletes that participate to its competitions, and WADA will test them in exceptional circumstances uh, directly. Um, this is where we come to um, WADA's role uh, in, in, in such proceedings. And of course, as WADA was uh, uh, appealing the decision in the Sunyan case and, and the reason for that, I, I do not here rely uh, or, or recall the, the mechanism that uh, allows WADA to appeal in a deadline following the ex the expiration of the deadline to appeal of, uh, of the National Anti-Doping Agency itself, but you will understand that um, um, different stakeholders or different uh, players can appeal decision, and when they have decided to eventually not appeal, WADA still has a right to appeal so that WADA can be sure to have a last word on every, uh, on, on every case, or at least to have a last call on every, on every, uh, on every case. And, um, and bring the case to CAS if it considers that the decision made by, in this case, FINA was not satisfactory uh, in, in the present case. This is what you see here, um, the reasoning of, uh, of, um, of, of this cascade of appeal deadlines um, uh, that, uh, well, Chikinara had could challenge the appeal decision uh, at first, and that uh, WADA could eventually uh, decide it. And here it is, it is interesting because uh, CAS or the CAS panel uh, explained uh, the reason why 
it was it, it is reasonable to have this inequality if you want because our estimated Chinese colleague before mentioned that there was inequality between WADA and the, and the, and the athlete and they say here in paragraph 176 where they say the special status and unique function of WADA serves it in the general interest to prevent and counter doping related violations in sport and in doing so it pursues one of the key object objectives of the Olympic Charter um, and this is the, the reason why uh, it has this right to appeal after the the, uh, the other the stakeholders decided eventually decided not to. Um, so who is involved in a process in a doping process? A testing authority. So that authority or that body which is uh, designed to test one specific athlete. Then a sample collection authority. In that case, that was IDTM, so a private company who is instructed by the testing authority to perform that testing. A result management authority that can also be another entity or the same entity depends on, on the cases. Uh, then an arbitral tribunal, we see CAS, this is the case here, an appeal tribunal, the Swiss Federal Tribunal, even if appeal is probably improper in this case because it's a very limited uh, power of, of review. ITA is another specific uh, entity uh, newly created and based in Lausanne also who can be instructed by specific uh, uh, federations, especially to perform some or, or all of its uh, um, of its tasks in, in anti-doping. So, reference to the Sunyan case. Sorry if it's pretty long, but it says that um, um, FINA had results management authority and authorized the mission as the testing authority. So, FINA was the testing authority and that the company IDTM was the sample collection authority. So you see that they are named differently um, and that it eventually, um, uh, that FINA formally asserted the violation. So FINA brought up the fact that there was a violation and in consideration of all of that, CAS uh, clearly found that uh, FINA was a testing authority and IDTM was the sample collection authority working on behalf of FINA. Um, then the FINA doping panel issued the decision. This is also important because FINA uh, were, was in charge of the results management. So we, when we speak of results management, it means who's in charge of taking the, the decision, decision that would be appealed. And then the arbitral tribunal was CAS and CAS found that it had jurisdiction to adju adjudicate this matter. Maybe a last word on the athlete because he's also a stakeholder, even if it's not a signatory, is directly interested at, at the issue of that. So what the athlete must do, um, first, the athlete must know the anti-doping rules. This is pretty tough because they are very complex and, and heavy. Uh, we, we might remember some cases where the, the athlete just did not know that, for example, a, a substance became prohibited uh, at one point, a substance which he had used for many years. So it, it comes to very har harsh uh, situations. If we remember, for example, Maria Sharapova, who used some very basic medication for years and which suddenly became uh, uh, prohibited and was suspended for, for quite a long period. Uh, so it may be harsh sanctions just because of this, but this is the strict liability of the athlete. Um, so he must know, know the rules. Uh, the athlete must be available for testing at all times. This is also quite a heavy requirement. Um, and he must be responsible for any substance found in each sample, such as, uh, as we said before, this uh, uh, represents the, the, the strict liability that, that, he, that he bears. And also the entourage of the athlete. So his, his team, his staff, his family, we have seen that this, this had a, an impact in the Sunan case. Uh, the entourage may cause an anti-doping rule violation by the athlete. So they must take care of this. Uh, the athlete cannot just rely on them and say, well, it's not my fault. I was badly advised. Uh, whatever bad advice he receives, he's responsible for it. And for example, in the Sun Young case, um, in respect of the athlete, first, uh, the cast says, uh, well, the athlete is a world-class athlete with an impressive list of sporting ach achievements. He's not, however, above the law or legal process. The rules applies, apply to him as they do to all athletes and he is required to comply with them. So of course, if he's required to comply with them, he has to know them before that. And as regarding his entourage, um, is the principle that an athlete is responsible for his or her own actions 
and cannot deflect responsibility to his support staff. It's a well-established caste jurisprudence. And this is, for example, as our colleague before mentioned, the first uh, anti-doping rule violation of Mr. Sun Yang, who was uh, done on behalf of bad advice received by his doctor. Well, this is bad luck, but, uh, but, but that's, the, that's the situation he faces. He, he assumes the responsibility for the mistakes of his staff. So that's it. Um, thank you very much for, for your, your attention. I hope this did not go too, too, fa too fast. I, I saw that there was some, uh, some maybe question. Um, um, or, or di discussions, but I don't know if that was, uh, no, that was not related to this. So thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, and yeah there is a question. That, uh, that why um, why there is a uh, increase in the budget like in your uh, in your slide page number seven there's a slight uh, there's an increase of the uh, of the waters uh, budget why uh, why it increased so significantly recently um, let me just go back to it you you mean in in which years Sorry, uh, I think in the in the slides in the page seven there is an increase. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, regarding the cash. Uh, sorry, the waters. Uh, the waters budget. Uh, why why do you think that there was an increase? What was the? Uh, so, so this budget that, was the. The budget was in in two. This was the two thousand eighteen figures. Um, I don't, I don't have a, uh, a specific explanation, but I wonder if this was, I wonder if it's just because the, the workload of WADA is, is expanding and they're doing more testing every year, or if it is related because they also had new, new bodies to fund uh, following especially the Russian case, because after the, after the Russian case, they, they had this new international standard for uh, compliance for code signatories and also the uh, committee uh, compliance committee, which had also a heavy load, so it, it might it might be related to this, but maybe others will have a, a more specific answer. Yeah, and, and I have this a question for um, regarding the, I, uh, the international standard or like ISTI, this kind of rules in different country. Uh, we got uh, participants uh, like uh, Miss uh, Kesnia from Russia, and uh, for example. Uh, I, I don't know how does it work in, in Russia or or, or, or in Sweden. Uh, let's say, Mr. Uh, Michael Walgren, can you comment that how was this uh, international standards integrated in your uh, in your country's anti-doping agency? For example, in Russia, I I, uh, I just heard the news uh, in the last November that there was a uh, uh, the the national team was banned uh, banned for the Olympics uh, for for a while, and also this year. There are several athletes involved in the anti-doping agency. So how was it? Uh, how how does the uh, Russian uh, or Russian lawyers think about the uh, or uh, the anti anti-doping rules provided by the WADA and uh, the uh, like the procedures like ISTI something? Uh oh, are you there, Miss uh, Kesenia? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So, how about in Sweden? So, uh, yes, in Sweden, I, 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 this is not my my core area, but I mean, uh, Sweden or Bavaria has worked on this for a long time, and and uh, as we do with most of these uh, rules, they are implemented uh, quite by the world. Word. I mean, this is really. Uh, in all instances, when we are signing on to some kind of regulations, they are uh, immediately, to so say, incorporated into the rules, and, and uh, I, this is should be the same case here. Ah, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, is there any further questions? Okay, great. So, um, yes, Jean-Pierre, Jean-Pierre. So, um, uh, I mean, just a, an observation on the budget for Mr. 
following the intervention of Mr. Boss. Yeah, great. It is clear that one very important aspect of the budget was the, imp the increase of the investigation uh, cost following the Russian uh, uh, cases. And they, uh, WADA built up a full and independent, I mean, structurally independent investigation department. And they were really uh, fully, fully, fully busy um, during the last years. Mm -hmm. They appointed uh, a former Interpol uh, inspector in Mr. Gunther. Um, I have, I have um, a blank on his name, but I mean, he's, he's one. He was one of the three experts on the first, uh, on the IC commission. And then he moved to at the investigation department of WADA and they are doing, uh, they have a massive uh, operational job to, to conduct. Thank you. Uh, we, we got a question from uh, Mr. Uh, Sheng Chang. Uh, can you explain your question? What does, uh, can you explain your question a little bit? Uh, hello, Ms. Sheng Chang. Uh, you, you have a question, does the term DCOs in the ISTI 5.33 refers to the DCO only or, uh, or it includes PCA or DCA? How, what is this question? Uh, how, how could you explain a little bit? Yeah, I want to know um, whether the terminology uh, DCOs uh, refer to a collective uh, team or just refer to one person, uh, DCO, including uh, BCA and the DCA. This is, uh, this is uh, uh, a terminology uh, very special in this case. So I want to know uh, what's the, uh, um, the true meaning of this terminology. Um, thank you very much. We can uh, leave someone who can answer it and they can uh, type it in the, in the box. So, uh, um, so we can move on. If anyone can answer this question, please uh, type in the box and we have to free to chat here. Uh, so, well, so let's move to the, uh, from the anti-doping, uh, we, we have some, uh, we, ha we have mapping, we have from the, uh, the cases, you know, the cases, and then how was the stakeholders in these cases. Now let's move to the um, uh, international sports arbitration. I mean, how does this uh, international sports arbitration works? How was the rules behind the CAS? What was the uh, players and uh, uh, and why uh, and uh, and how how does CAS? What kind of what kind of institution is like CAS? Uh, and what alternative institutions besides CAS to do the sports arbitration? And uh, let me uh, welcome. Uh, uh, Mr. Um, Lucero Valoni. Uh, Dr. Lucero Valoni is highly experienced litigating in both international and domestic criminal, commercial, and arbitration cases in Swiss courts, up to Swiss federal Supreme Court level. Lucero Valoni is well known for his exercise in the field of um, appealing arbitration awards to the Swiss federal Supreme Court, especially in sports arbitration. Lucero Valoni is also a partner at Bori uh, and Zurich. And the more important, he is also the book of uh, the writer of the sports law arbitration in Switzerland, uh, which uh, I got it last summer. It was really good. Uh, it's a, it's not a, um, it has the third edition now. Uh, it is uh, uh, very densely written regarding the um, regarding the uh, the sports law uh, in Switzerland. So um, now floor is yours, uh, Mr. Valoni. Hello to everybody. I hope you can hear me and see me. Um, thank you for uh, this um, Swiss Chinese Law Association and for the invitation to have a speech about this. I will um, talk about uh, the following. I try now to bring in the topic. Uh, how is it? Where is it? Uh, here. Uh, Can you already see it? Um, can you see it? Huh? Is it okay? Yes, it's perfect. Okay, good. Uh, introduction of international sports arbitration. The time is very short, so it can be only a little bit high level. 
but uh, um, there are people who uh, perhaps have never done sport arbitration before. That's the reason why I'm going on this high level. Now, I, I will talk about uh, the four topics, settlement of sports related disputes in sport, then the international courts of sports organization internationally in the federations, and then the sport arbitration and uh, something about the court of arbitration for sport. Um, okay, um, now if uh, it is clear that if, if, um, if you want to run a, a sport federation, you also want to um, uh, make sure that your rules are applied and also especially disciplinary rules, you, you want to have them applied and uh, that is necessary, you need a certain power. And this power is coming from the state law and national law is there different from country to country. But what we can say, a lot of organizations are based in Switzerland and Switzerland does give a lot of power to any federation and any association. In, and this is protected even by the uh, constitution. So, um, and this gives the right to set up rules and even to enforce them. Now, um, this, this gives also, this, this law, this national law, uh, gives the right to this international federation which seat in Switzerland, but in, in a lot of countries this would also be possible, um, that they can, um, decide that certain internal bodies within a sport organization have a right to, um, let's say, put some decisions in respect of their, uh, of the application of their own rules. Normally, the, that is, uh, that are the uh, disciplinary rules of, of the organization that are dealt with by an internal body. And this is clear that the national law gives some guidelines how such decisions can be taken. The first and most important point is that um, all these federations which have an internal decision-making uh, process in place have to respect uh, a very, very basic principle of law, like the right to be heard and uh, a fair hearing and all these kind of important uh, basic rules. And of course, uh, what they have to respect is always their own statutes. That is very important. So uh, they, they have to be measured by respecting their old statutes and regulations. So, um, now, um, what is, if, if they have such a deciding body in, in, in their organ, organization as every international federation has, they have to, you have to um, follow first always the internal procedure. That means you have to um, bring the case to these internal federation deciding bodies. And, and if there is a second possibility to appeal the decision within the organization, you have to go first to this second instance. And only if you have taken all steps that the Federation has provided for, you can think about other things. And that would be either you go to a state court, which is, no, that was always the case before. In Switzerland, you can bring every case against any Federation with a seat in Switzerland to the state court. But of course, uh, the federations, they don't like that. And that is the reason why they have introduced an arbitration system. 
And uh, this is possible according to Swiss law because the Swiss law is very arbitration friendly and it allows the Federation to introduce such an arbitration system. And this was done by a lot of Federation, the most of them, and this is done that the state courts do have very little to say in the end. And this gives the power to the uh, arbitration court you refer to as a sport organization. And this has become a generalized principle now, uh, a practice, and uh, it is possible. But still, you could always, even if arbitration is agreed on, you could theoretically still go on to every state court. But of course, the other side, the federation, will then say, well, uh, uh, the, the state court is not competent anymore because there is an arbitration court. That is something uh, to think about. Then, here, what was the idea of bringing sport arbitration into, into uh, uh, arbitration into the sport system? And it is uh, uh, different things are important. Uh, it should be quick, simple, and flexible in arbitration. Well, quick with the costs, it's not always the case, but still quicker than a state court. That is something we can we can say. So that is true then. And what is very important in, in, uh, in sport, uh, we have international federations that set the rules for the whole world, for the whole sport applicable in the whole world. Now, if we allow state courts to decide on cases, uh, then even if the rules are the same, every state court could come to a different interpretation of the rules and they, this would bring no harmonization into uh, the sports world and that was one of the main reason to have a sport arbitration um, put in place and then there is another uh, aspect um, if we come back then to, to costs, uh, there is a specialized judges on this list you can uh, you can choose from and this gives you a more uh, chance to have somebody who understands the background of sport and that is what the state courts sometimes have difficulties to to uh, see because they do not often deal with sport cases that was the idea now, uh, in arbitration, as you uh, probably know, uh, it's, it's not uh, given from God. You cannot go to uh, an arbitration court without having a clear arbitration clause. And uh, in, in international sports, it's always the case that all these big federations, they put in place in their statutes a rule that you have to accept first the court of arbitration that they do accept the court of arbitration for sport but also that you have to appeal to the court of arbitration for sport i have put here the fifa rules for example which allows you then to go to the court of arbitration for sport and the statutes do always always also say that you are not allowed to go to a state court normally and uh, um, that is why um, all everybody is going to the Court of Arbitration for Sport. So um, now, yes, now we, uh, I have talked about the, the Court of Arbitration for Sport, but uh, how did everything start? And it was Juan Antonio Samaranch who had the idea back in 1983 and uh, uh, it came into force in 1984. So he was the one who was saying, we need, we need something harmonized, uh, uh, an arbitration court who is deciding on everything in sport. And they put in place in their statutes a rule which was saying everything which 
every dispute in connection with the Olympic Games or in relation or any dispute in relation to the Olympic Games uh, has now to go to the Court of Arbitration for Sport. That was the starting point of the Court of Arbitration for Sport. And this was made possible because Chapter 12, as I told you, of the Swiss International Private Law Act is very, very, um, uh, let's say, easy for arbitration. With Switzerland is a very arbitration friendly place. That's the reason why a lot of, of arbitration taking place in Switzerland, a part of the Swiss law, which is considered a little bit a neutral law. But it gives a, a, a lot of freedom to the arbitrators. If you look at chapter 12, the state court is eliminated to a limit because any decision of, the, uh, of an arbitration court can be appealed only for very, very, very limited cases. And uh, if we go back in history, uh, since 1984, uh, only 13 or 14 cases from the Court of Arbitration for Sport could be overturned. I, I could do one, but uh, I did, of course, lot, lot much more uh, appeals where I was thinking it should have been overturned. But uh, you see, it's very difficult to win in front of the, our court for, uh, of the Swiss Federal Supreme Court. But it shows the big, big power that Switzerland gives to, the, uh, to, to an arbitration panel. Now, um, uh, if we are looking at the IOC, in the beginning, it was IOC financing costs, making the rules. IOC made everything. And uh, this was going on for 10 years, up to the moment uh, of, the, of a, a, a horse rider, Grundle, who was bringing a case to the Swiss Federal Supreme Court saying, uh, first of all, it's not a correct arbitration body. It is not okay that IOC is financing everything. She could not win the case, but the case led to uh, um, some clarification of the Swiss Federal Supreme Court that was saying, yes, the Court of Arbitration for Sport is accepted as an independent sport court, uh, arbitration court. But they were saying, uh, due to the fact that, that uh, IOC is financing everything and deciding on every rule in, in costs, this is uh, something that we would not accept as an independent court in case IOC would be a counterpart. But in the Grundle case, IOC was not a counterpart, only a national federation. That's the reason why the Swiss Federal Supreme Court did then um, not uh, annul the cast decision. But it led to a change and an introduction of something new. And this was the International Council of Arbitration for Sport. This body is now financed still by IOC and by FIFA and the big federations. And they set all the rules. But cost is then something, let's say, a little bit different from ICOS. These are two independent bodies in the end. OK. This is what I told you already. Okay, the new system now, uh, the ICOS is, is, what are they doing? I will come back to later on it, but who is member of ICOS? It consists of 20 members. Four members are appointed by International Sports Federation, four members appointed by Association of National Olympic Committees, four members are appointed by IOC, and four members are appointed by the 12 already mentioned and uh, to safeguard the interests of the athletes and four members appointed by the rest of the 16. So you can see uh, from a point of view of athletes, right? This is of course something which is not a balanced uh, composition because in the end, even the athletes' representative are selected 
by federation representatives. And that makes it quite difficult to, uh, to have the athlete's voice heard properly in ICOS. But we will see how the, the, the power of ICOS is, and it is very important. The ICOS is important. They decide the CAS code, they elect the president and the vice president, they elect the president of the ordinary arbitration division, and what is most important, they elect the president of the appeals arbitration division. And they appoint the CAS general secretary and they put the persons uh, you have to select from the cost arbitrators on the list. You have to know that you cannot choose, normally in arbitration, you can choose every body, every lawyer, or he must not even be a lawyer. You can choose everybody in, in an arbitration court. But here in the Court of Arbitration for Sport, the idea was to have specialized people deciding cases, and that's the reason why you cannot select everybody, but only, oh, uh, sorry for that. I don't know how to put that away. <laughs> how is that possible? Huh? Do you know how? <laughs> You see the rest also, huh? <laughs> Thank you for sharing our emails. So, so uh, yeah. uh, I, I think would you go to the US? Um, oh, okay. no, no, I have, I have it again. <laughs> yes. Okay, yes. sorry yes. for that. <laughs> okay, so that's, the, that's what they do. They have a lot of power and um, they decide also about challenges to, for uh, arbitrators, that's ICAS who decides, not the cost. Huh? Okay, so, and the cost, what is doing the cost? I think the cost, um, what we have to discuss here is, um, they, they make also mediation, they do, um, they decide also on, uh, um, normal arbitration, but, what do they do? They have arbitration and there there is two different possibilities. You can have a contract between two persons and they can include the court of arbitration for sport. And then there is no international federation, you go first. So it's an ordinary arbitration, you go to the cost as a first instance. But this is not so important in COS. The, the most important thing is the appeal. That means COS is there to control a decision of a federation. And that is what the most cases are about. These are appeal cases. Huh? What they also do is they give legal opinions to federations and they have newly introduced a uh, cost anti-doping division that is given uh, the opportunity for certain federations who have not the knowledge or not the willingness anymore to deal with these quite complex doping cases and uh, cost here would act as a first instance case in case FINA would have accepted this cost anti-doping division it would not be a decision that you had to appeal to cause from uh, um, Chinese uh, decision-making body or uh, international decision-making body, but now it would have to, you would have to appeal the cost anti-doping division to cause to the ordinary cost appeal. Now, um, um, then costs also in certain big tournaments, they do provide for ad hoc divisions where they put in place special rules for Olympic Games, World Cup and so on, uh, which normally should um, give the possibility for quick decisions. And these peoples are on the spot, they are there, and uh, that's, that's the idea behind that, that you do not have to wait for months. So, but 
you have to have a decision within 24 or 48 hours, whatever it is. Now, uh, as I told you, the, the most important thing is the appeals arbitration procedure. And what is always important, it needs an arbitration clause. Otherwise, the cost is not competent. Um, now, normally, an arbitration clause is put in a contract. In sports, it's not always like that. It's, it's a little bit different because we know the pyramidical structure of sport. On the top, there is always an international federation. Then there is the national federation and the clubs or, or yeah, and then the players in the end. But the international federation, they force the national federation to accept their statutes, which includes uh, a commitment to have arbitration, like costs. And so it goes down to up to the player who has to accept the rules of the club, the club had to accept the rules of the federation and so on. And that's the reason how all in sports, all sports athletes have to accept the Court of Arbitration for Sport, especially in disciplinary cases where we can talk about a so-called forced arbitration. So it's not by free will. Normally arbitration is by free will, but not in sports arbitration is it always the case. So then um, what are the topics costs can decide on? It can be disciplinary cases, sanctions applied by FIFA, um, doping is disciplinary, for example, or it can be non-disciplinary, like uh, employment law disputes, where you go first to the FIFA dispute resolution chamber in international in international dimension cases, and then you can go and bring the case to the Court of Arbitration for Sport. That is something um, which is not disciplinary, but is dealt with by costs as well. And and of course. When, the most of the cases of, of costs are coming from football nowadays. Now, uh, ordinary arbitration proceedings, there are certain rules. You have to make a request for arbitration. That's very similar to normal arbitration. You have to pay the, the court fees and uh, I do not mention everything. And then it goes to the other side. They can file an answer. Of course, they have to also appoint an arbitrator from the list. It's a closed list. You cannot choose anyone else who is also specialized in sports law. You have to use somebody from the list. But there are 390 persons on the list and from, very, uh, uh, from a lot of countries. Now the panel um, is then appointed and uh, important is that uh, there will be a, a hearing, uh, an evidentiary proceeding as in every arbitration and uh, we come to the applicable law and the award later on because we have to focus on the appeal in arbitration proceedings which is the most common thing in sport. Now here you have also to, stay, uh, to file a statement of appeal uh, you have to name your arbitrator. You can choose whether you want to have one arbitrator or whether you have a panel of three. That's something you can do. Um, and you have to show the Court of Arbitration for Sport why they are competent. That means you need to have a link to a certain arbitration clause or provision in the statutes or in your contract. Then uh, the important thing is you have to file your appeal against a decision of an international federation, which is the last decision in that federation only. Huh? Uh, you have to do it in a certain time. And uh, you to find out which, which time frame is relevant, you have to go to the federation you are trying to appeal a decision against. And perhaps they have different rules. 
uh, they can say it, it can be within 10 days. So in certain, in certain cases, for example, UEFA uh, has certain procedure in which you have to make an appeal within 10 days. And if the uh, statutes of the Federation are silent, then you have to do it within 21 days. You have your, you file your appeal in within 21 days. The, this is not the full motivation of your appeal. It's only the statement of appeal. Huh? Then, after you have filed your statement of appeal, you have another 10 days to bring the real motivation. Huh? You have to bring all name of witnesses, your experts, and the full reasoning. And here is very important um, that you do normally have no second chance. That means you have to bring all your witnesses, all your experts, all your full support of factual uh, surroundings in your first application in the appeal brief. Otherwise, it can be too late. Then COS sends the statement of appeal to the other side and they have also to uh, um, elect an arbitrator and they have then within 20 days to find its answer and uh, statement of defense and you have to bring any defense of lack of jurisdiction as from that point in time. That is quite important if you want to bring the jurisdiction to a problem for the other side, you have to do it in your first application. Then, uh, as I told you, you have to bring everything in your first application. That's due to rule 56 of the CAS code. And uh, you are not allowed to supplement your arguments unless, of course, the president of the panel orders differently. Or if the application of the counter side reveals certain things you could not have foreseen, then you could do it. Then what can a cost uh, panel do? They decide de novo. They have full power of review. That means they put themselves at the place of the federation. So you appeal a FINA decision in, in our uh, Chinese case, the Chun case. So CAS is acting as they would be FINA. The decision of FINA does not exist anymore. They, they come up with a new decision. Of course, they can confirm the decision of, of the previous instance theoretically, but they come up with something new and they are not bound by the previous decision. And of course, they have uh, the discretion of excluding evidences that you um, have not brought up in the first instance. So it is very important to try to uh, bring everything what is possible already in a first instance. For example, in the FIFA dispute resolution chamber, there were a lot of clubs that uh, tried to be silent in cases and bring no answer to, yeah, to then start with the fight in the cost proceedings only. That was the reason why this rule was changed that somebody cannot be inactive in first instance and then in the second instance uh, with a surprise bring all new evidence. That is something the cost panel could stop. But it's not clear when they stop it, but they could stop some such behavior. Now, um, the hearing in cost, it was never public up to the um, uh, decision of uh, the Court of Human Rights in Pechstein. I brought the case to the Swiss Federal Supreme Court in the Pechstein case um, and I requested that uh, a public hearing must take place and it was also requested already in costs, but it was not granted and in the end 
the Court of Human Rights did decide that you have such a right. What is important about this decision in the Pechstein case is that it was clearly said that um, Article 6 of the Convention of Human Rights is applicable in sports arbitration, which is not the case in commercial arbitration. It was only as of before the Pechstein decision in commercial arbitration, it is only indirectly applicable. And this is not the case here. And now it, you have a right to a public hearing that was decided. And, uh, um, and you can, of course, you have rec to request it. And you can bring oral arguments, witnesses, and experts will be heard. Then the most difficult thing in, uh, let's say, in, in uh, sports arbitration before COS is to find out what kind of law the panel will really apply. And the, the mess is in here. <laughs> it's described in this article 58, which tells you that a lot is possible, uh, but you never know exactly how it will end up. Huh? And uh, that is something. But it, Swiss law at a certain point in time will always come. Then they come the awards. What is interesting here, no dissenting opinion is allowed, which is quite interesting, but not good, I think. For the development of the case law, it should be allowed. And uh, the award uh, shall be made public um, unless both parties agree. So I think um, I can stop here. I can also talk a little bit about uh, suspensive effect. Uh, what is important to know that if you appeal a decision like in this uh, Chinese case, um, if you appeal to cause, it's not automatically suspensive effect that is granted. You have to request for such uh, uh, an expensive, um, uh, suspensive effect or for provisional measures. And there you have to, to prove three things. You have to show to the panel that there is a risk for the athlete of irreparable damage. That is uh, possible theoretically. Then uh, probability of success, you have to show that your case has, has, has good chances. And uh, you have to deal with the balance of interests of clean athletes and your client. So you have to find out a way um, to, to get this suspensive effect. You can get it. We have seen in the Guerrero case, uh, it was possible. And we have seen it also in the Pechstein case where um, uh, that was not given, but in front of the Swiss for the Supreme Court, it was given. So I think that is a little bit uh, about, uh, in a nutshell, about uh, arbitration in Switzerland and yeah. Um, thank, thank you very much, Mr. Valoni. Thank you for this uh, great presentation. Uh, we, we have a very, uh, I have a small question regarding um, in the history, right? It's uh, difficult to get appeal, but in the, what are the um, what are those the, the legal ground for those cases has been overturned by the federal uh, supreme court in, in in Switzerland? What are usually this uh, could be the reason? Well. Um... We, we have to, to uh, know the following. Um, there are only very limited grounds, as I told you, and this is um, like that, I can tell you. It's um, five grounds, five grounds that are possible. It's wrongful appointment of the arbitral tribunal. That means if they select in, in the cost case somebody from outside the list, that would be wrongful. Huh? Or if the parties agree to uh, having a, three arbitrators and they select only one arbitrator, for example. Then this is very seldom. You can forget about that ground. Then incorrect decision on jurisdiction, that is the one that is most successful. Because, and tell you why, because 
if you appeal on the jurisdictional issue, the Swiss Federal Supreme Court has full discretion on review. And that, that is the, the big difference to the other points. Because on the other points, you have to think about, normally a judge can see the whole picture where you see me. <laughs> but now, with the Swiss Federal Supreme Court in jurisdiction can see the whole picture, quite the whole. But in the other cases, for example, uh, the right to be heard or the breach of order public or the decision made uh, against somebody has not even asked, no, no party has asked that he should, uh, that the, the decision shall be like that or that, then you can, um, you can also go to uh, the Swiss Federal Supreme Court. But the line is only one small line they can look at the case and the rest they have to forget because they are bound by what the arbitration panel has done. And that is what people little bit forget, that they think that the Swiss Federal Supreme Court has a look at everything. It's not true. You even have to tell our highest court, you, you see, imagine this, the highest court of Switzerland, you have to even tell them what the law is. What the hell is that? <laughs> you have to tell them the law is like that. And if you do not that exactly, you have no chance. Uh, which is strange, strange, but yeah. okay. It's the law. It's the law. <laughs> so it's Thank very difficult you. to win. And, and we it's, have a Russian colleague. It's uh, uh, 1%, 1 yeah. or 2%. Yeah, uh, we, we have a, a Russian colleague, uh, Ms. Uh, Milinikova. Are you there, Ms. Milinkova? That she asks some questions regarding uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, the figures. I'm very curious, you know, for from Russian side. I mean, how would you think of the uh, the the cases or the judgments in last uh, November regarding your country? And uh, how do you think about the case as uh, legal professionals in Russian? Do you do you think uh, do do you have some ideas to share? Are you there? You're you're talking about the the Russian cases, the different. Yes, yeah, I'm asking uh, Mr. Uh, Melinikova uh, whether she can share uh -huh. some ideas from uh, from her point of view. Hello, Miss Melinikova. Hello. Okay, so maybe we will left it uh, later. So, um, uh, is there any questions regarding uh, regarding Ms. Uh, uh, Mr. Valoni's presentation? Uh, we got one question from uh, uh, me, uh, Mr. Emily. Uh, she, he asked uh, why the award in Sunyang did not decide on the witness tampering other than the procedural confidentiality orders in the course of proceeding, which is recurring problems. In many cases, uh, first, I'm not quite sure what is uh, the question. Mr. Koreshi, could you uh, uh, explain a little bit more of the question? Wait, wait, wait. Uh, I need to, uh, you need to unmute. He needs to activate his uh, microphone. He has not. A yes. Um Oh, there we go. Okay. Sorry, uh, okay. Now you are hearing me? No, hold, hold on. Yes, yes. How about now? You hear me? Yes. Okay. You hear me now? Yes. 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 Okay. So my question is: my question is, 
There have been many instances of witness tampering uh, complained by WADA in the award against the respondent, but I see no pronouncement from the tribunal in the award concerning the issue other than the procedural orders that it had already issued uh, uh, in the procedure, rather than in the award, anything to say that. You are not hearing. To whom is this question? Yeah, the question I mentioned is with regard to the witness tampering in the case. Yeah, I'm not a lawyer from uh, <laughs> from this Chinese. Uh, you have to ask the Chinese <laughs> person. Yes. Well, okay. Perhaps Mr. Boss could have explained, but apparently he's off now. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mr. Ameli, I think yes. I briefly responded to your question because that's something I also very I'm also very concerned about. Um, yes. So I think maybe the panel already exercised their discretion um, to draw the adverse inferences. But I wonder, yes. and maybe my learned colleague um, can, can, can also share their insights, whether um, CAS and under Swiss law, uh, what type of measures they could take to you know, protect the witness, witnesses or, can, um, or take actions for these matters. No, uh, you recall uh, in the same provision that the, of FINA uh, DC that provides for uh, tampering violation of the testing process. Also in the end of the same provision, I guess it's 205, uh, it's talking about uh, witness tampering. And WADA has complained frequently in the case about the witness tampering in the process of the case. And I see no decision by the award concerning it, other than the procedural order of confidentiality, which is a completely different thing. It, I assume that the court should have at least said something more than the procedural orders that had earlier mentioned. Yeah, I, I think that we can leave these questions for uh, for later, and we can uh, any question any uh, uh, any colleagues if they re re read about the the judgment, they did, did not the same. The judgment itself, itself did not say anything whether the uh, the athletes tempering the uh, the witnesses, but uh, uh, it's more about uh, other things. So why did this is a remain a question? Why the, the the judgment doesn't say that. So uh, may, may, may I, may I, Zhang, may I, may I say a word on this one? I mean, this tampering, this specific tampering uh, offense is, in my view, a very difficult one because it mixes two things. It mixes the, the offense which started the process and then possibly an offense which on its own could be a new offense and be actually it should be the basis of new proceedings and that's a bit the difficulty of this i think it was put in the in let's say in the first line offenses uh, definition but it does not really belong to that and uh, i i'm i'm a little bit dubious about the, the the solution of the code in this respect because as you i mean this one is an example i mean what do you want do you, do you do you restart a case on ADRV based on a violation of the process dealing with another ADRV and that is why I think the, the panel cautiously left it out and not did not come back and in my experience I have had uh, several cases including this one and first instance where the issue and I am very neutral here uh, can could arise I have had another one which was a Croatian case where um, they went to the door of the DCO and they, and they knock at his door and, and uh, tell him that he was wrong, uh, members of the family and m m of the entourage of the athlete, and it was relatively scary for the DCO. It's, it's one issue which, 
which has to be addressed because uh, DCOs are exposed personnel. I mean, one may think one, one, one will, but it's not easy to, to, uh, to conduct doping collection process in an environment which may be hostile because it concerns a national hero, for example, or because the people try to intervene with the witnesses. But the, the difficulty with the 2-5 as it stands now, it, it really questions whether then you, you must restart a full first instance proceedings when it happens, actually. Because the appeal process cannot extend beyond the scope of the first instance. And the first instance, if you have, for example, uh, witness intimidation in the middle, let's say between the first instance decision uh, and the appeal, which was the case in my Croatian case, case by the way, uh, what do you do? Do you restart a case? The appeal authority cannot start. I mean, CS cannot start by itself a new case. And the other one, the, let's, say the, let's say the prosecuting authority, in this case FINA, what should they do? They it should actually restart, or WADA in this case, they should restart a process on its own merits, if I may say so. Well, voila. I think it opens the door to very difficult um, uh, this, uh, issues. I think it was put there because it was recognized that this may happen, but I'm not sure of the solution to put it in the first line uh, often. Voilà. In international arbitration and commercial arbitration, when these things happen, the various measures the arbitral tribunal can take uh, against the respondent uh, if there is evidence of spot. But in this case, perhaps evidence, uh, perhaps evidence uh, wasn't quite clear. In one of the orders, the tribunal said if it was proven, um, in the sense that apparently for the tribunal, one of the items of the tempering wasn't quite uh, evident. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, now we have, uh, uh, sorry, we had got, got a little bit late, the delay, we all have like 20 minutes delay, but I still wish everyone we can have a, a small break uh, for five minutes uh, to have some water um, uh, and join some, uh, some snacks and come back in five minutes. Uh, if you did not come back, uh, if you are, uh, like say, sit there, like um, we can go through with the introduction of yourself. So I'm going, what I'm going to do during these five minutes, uh, you, can, you can get some water. Or I'm, I'm here is to read, uh, read every person's name. And uh, if you would like to introduce yourself, who you are and what you do and uh, what you're interested in to the sports arbitration, if I get no uh, response, uh, I will move on. So, uh, so now we come to uh, Mr. Uh, Chang Sheng. Sheng Chang, could you introduce yourself a bit? Oh, thank you very much. Um, I'm work, uh, working at the uh, Beijing Huizhong Law Firm um, uh, and, and I advise the clients on uh, international commercial arbitration and, and mediation. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you. And the next one is uh, 14 113 <laughs> Could you introduce yourself? Sorry, I, don't, I, I have to go to this list. <laughs> Okay, so um, next one, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Bo Yi. Mr. Yi Bo, could you, uh, are you there? Could you introduce yourself? Um, next one is uh, Mr. Uh, well, Mr. Florian Muller. Are you there? Yes, I'm there. Hi, everyone. Uh, Hi. My name is Florian. <laughs> Hi. Kenzo. My name is Florian Mueller. Uh, I'm the head China desk of uh, MLL, We're one of the biggest law firms in Switzerland, and we advise uh, Chinese clients in Switzerland and Swiss clients in China. Myself, uh, I'm a Swiss attorney. I have an LLM in Chinese law from Hong Kong University, and I'm a, a fellow of CR. So we advise a Chinese clients in Switzerland and Swiss clients in China in arbitration matters regularly. Nice to meet you all. Um, thank you, Mr. Florian. And the uh, next one is John, uh, Gianmarco Cali. Yes, hi everyone. I'm Gianmarco Cali. I'm an associate in Geneva, Switzerland. I'm a Swiss lawyer. I practice in white collar crime and uh, international commercial arbitration. And I also am a student at the University of Neuchâtel in uh, sports law. Hi everyone. Okay. 
Um, and next one uh, is uh, Mr. Uh, Khaled uh, Chaudhuri. Sorry for my terrible pronunciation. Uh, hi, uh, I'm from Bangladesh. Uh, I'm practicing in the Supreme Court. I'm a barrister. I'm also a mediator of the ADL International. We train and we also do mediation. I'm also a fellow of the Chartered Institute. Uh, so I'm doing a bit of everything. I also run a law college in Bangladesh. We are specializing in uh, University of London and DPP education here in Bangladesh. Uh, so uh, uh, sports law is one of my passions. I, I, I advise uh, Rongpur Riders, the one of the teams uh, uh, in the Bangladesh Premier League. I'm also a counsel for the uh, BPL match fixing case, uh, defending more Dashrapul and Darren Stephens in Bangladesh in 2013. Uh, sports law is quite uh, still budding in Bangladesh. Uh, we need a lot of awareness amongst the uh, um, sports federations and also amongst the players. Unfortunately, this is not uh, progressing that much. So I think this kind of uh, interaction would be a great boost for me uh, uh, for the future. So I'd like to work with all of you in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kellad. Uh, thank you for, for joining us. And the next one is Mr. Uh, uh, Jin, Jin Wen Feng. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Could you introduce yourself? Uh, a nice background, by the way. Yes. <laughs> Nice to meet you guys. I'm very happy to join this great event. Uh, my name is Jing Wenfeng. Uh, I also from Beijing, uh, from Angel Law Firm. You know, my specialty is uh, basically intellectual property rights, as well as entertainment and sports law. And I'm also uh, the member of FISU Legal Committee, and newly appointed. So um, it's very happy to join uh, this event and I would like to communicate with you guys to discuss about this uh, sports law uh, mainly on the Sun Yang case. I think we'll have a lot of fun here. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the, the next one, uh, 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 Mr. Raffle. Uh, Raffle, are, are you there? <laughs> yeah, hello everybody. My name is Raphael. For those who haven't seen me in the last uh, webinar, uh, I'm originally from Zurich, Switzerland, and I'm living in China for about two years. I'm based in Chongqing, and I'm the incoming office manager for the Bedin and Lee LLP, which is a Hong Kong-based uh, law firm. Um, and I'm a greenhorn in, in sports law, so I already learned a lot today. Thanks a lot for that. Um, thank you very uh, uh, everyone. I hope everyone is coming back. We'll do the rest uh, a little bit in a later stage and uh, in the last part. Um, and um, um, I hope everyone is there and uh, have had a great water, enjoying the uh, the break. And uh, uh, so it is great. Like we, when we have the, this kind of discussions, we have lawyers, but in the sports law, we need to. Uh, it's essential to bring the professionals. I mean, the athletes to joining with us as well. So that's why. Uh, we, uh, I'm, uh, it's my great honor to uh, invite Mr. Jumpy, uh, who was a gold medal winner in the 2004 Summer Olympic Games, um, uh, to, uh, to give us a discussion uh, regarding her perspective or like an athletic perspective, uh, a personal perspective of anti-doping. And Ms. Jumping is a renowned former professional athlete in China national volleyball team as a middle blocker. And he was, uh, he's the Golden uh, Generation member. Uh, she is a gold medal winner in the 2004 Summer Olympic Games in Athens. During her professional career, she led the team to win 2003 Asian Volleyball Championship, 2006 Asian Games, 2003 FV, FIVB Volleyball World Cup, etc. Currently, she is currently a, a lecturer in the Chinese University of Hong Kong. So, um, uh, Mr. Zhang, and the uh, uh, floor is yours. Hello, hello, everyone. Hello. Um, um, uh, hello, uh, can, you, can you hear me? Okay. Um, so, uh, um, now I'll open my PowerPoint. Okay, um, hello everyone. I'm uh, delighted to be here and I have this opportunity to share something with um, many outstanding lawyers around the world. 
Today, my topic is a personal perspective of anti-doping. So um, this is my presentation content. I'm going to talk about uh, doping in sport and uh, world anti-doping agents, WADA, and a high performance team in sport. So the first one I want to talk about um, as euro stimulate are drugs that usually cut on the central nervous system to modulate mental function and behavior, increase an individual's sense of excitement and decrease the sensation of fatigue. It's usually for increase uh, muscle power or endurance, such as springs in track and field or marathon and so on. But different sports need different, uh, need different physical condition. For the weightlifting, if two athletes in 50 kilogram division, both having 100 kilogram, then the one who with lead less will be the champion. So uh, diuretics or water pill, which help the kidneys flush ex extra water, metabolic product of the drug and the east side effects from body and a decreased body weight. And for another one about uh, shooting golf and archery, other kind of stimulate depressant that can help players stay in the extreme, keep climb, stability, and a quiet level. My friend told me a perfect and a stable timing for shooting is between heartbeats. So um, as, talk, um, as a technology advanced, the doping to current to player needs increase. There are, um, there are about nine kind of substance of stimulate. Uh, next, I want to talk about the, the water. I say the reason for the band are mainly the health streaks of performance enhancing drugs and the equally of opportunity for athletes and the exemplar effect of drug-free sport for the public. The water was set up on 1999. So it is uh, to uh, this to fight about uh, against drug in the sport. Before 2005, I attend all of the doping checks was in of competition simple collection. I remember when I finished from a day and match, the doping control officer, DCO, find our team doctor and uh, the uh, credential for all players and then and did lucky draw process. Because volleyball is a team sport, the DCO only choose one player to attend doping check. I was a lucky one chosen by the DCO. Um, the DCO lead me and went to a room with a toilet. And then she showed me the collection equipment. After that, we went to the to toilet together. She looked at me, finished my urine collection in the disposable cup and uh, verified it is my bo body fluid. And, and then I put my urine sample to the right A and the blue B bottom respectively and uh, closed tightly. And then put in the box in the white box and seal it, seal, seal it. Finally, I set in a document, the doping check, simple collection finished. So um, the World Anti-Doping Agency mission is to lead a collaborative worldwide movement for doping free sport, whether in or out of competition using performing enhanced drugs goes against the spring of the sport. So anti-doping administration management system, ADAMS, was launched in 2005 for the initial flight freeze. The system has since then been introduced and implemented by most anti-doping organizations, ADAMS, and all what, what are 
accelerated anti-doping laboratories. The, the web-based functional, functionality show athletes to comply with the whereabout rules of their sport by entering their information from anywhere in the world. This is the uh, diagram to show us this whereabout module in use. The color of the gray and the orange is for residents. Fill in your overnight accommodation. The blue one is for traveling. That is including routine number, departure location, arrive location, date, time, and details like uh, returning from match. And the green is for competition. The yellow is for your regular activities, such as your training, your work schedule. And on, um, according to this calendar that from all elite athletes around the world, the Adams Doping Control Database provided to Adams in an essential tool to managing both in and out of competition doping control program. Okay, this is the uh, picture to show us the simple collection equipment. And uh, uh, this is the document which I found from the FINA website. I think this is the humanization design statement for freshmen to upgrade to comfort uh, of operation for a wearable module. FINA doping control rules approached by the FINA Congress on 29th November 2014. This is a statement about whereabouts failures of anti-doping rules violence, uh, violations. Any combinations of three missed tests and uh, or failing failures as defined it in an international standard for testing and investigation within a 12 months crowded by an athlete in a registered testing pool. Next, I want to talk about a high performance team in sport. For my opinion, there are three members around athletes should include the coach, the team doctor, and team leader at least. For daily training, that include access content, intensity, timing, how to use uh, strategy and uh, statistic in match, comply with the coach. For medical part, involves uh, involved uh, nutrition intake, athlete, athletic rehabilitation, body check, and uh, doping check, submit to the team doctor. For transmit the policy, social part, and the daily arrangement like endorsement and advertising and so on, obey on the team leader. There are three persons to help athletes focus on training and uh, competitions. I hope one day a lawyer can enjoy the team who can perfect in the West and the East legislation, understanding the legal and the court procedure design a, a training program of mode court and finding out the compelling evidence that can safeguard athletes interests and also to help them to get more competitions that is um, all of my competitions thanks for listening thank you all thank you very much mr uh, mr john uh, uh, um, I would like to ask if there are any questions uh, for uh, uh, for Mr. John uh, uh, and uh, besides the signatures and photos. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, I mean, it's, um, uh, as athletes, I have a question like if, um, how, uh, like, you, uh, like, how do you think, uh, like, uh, if they, if you have some uh, legal problems, like, uh, if you have some problems uh, as a Chinese athlete, who are you going to call for help? Uh, do you have a lawyer? Do you have a, a, like a, a, some people like to, to offer help? Um, I don't have any uh, personal lawyer. I, uh, I say uh, we have the team leader. The team leader will help uh, uh, all the athletes to deal with some um, documents, some uh, the, the, the legal fees, 
and to um, represent our maybe in some documents. We don't know. We don't, okay. we don't actually know the detail, I mean. Yeah, how about in other countries? Uh, for example, let's say uh, in Bangladesh. So, uh, Mr. Uh, Khaled, how about in your country? Like, do you, Atlas has a lawyer or how does it work? Okay, sorry. Uh, it's unfortunate because uh, unless someone is in trouble, I mean, people do not actually go to a lawyer. So, uh, as a general rule, I would say even we've got uh, highly paid stars like uh, in cricket, like Sakib Al Hassan, uh, Mushfiq Rahim, and you know, uh, even they do not really have a lawyer, as far as I know. Uh, when I advised uh, as them as a team, uh, I found that was uh, wanting, uh, and, and that is why I, I, I stress on the point that more sort of awareness building workshops should be uh, organized. And many of the athletes are not really, I'm very sorry to say, not into education and stuff. So they need maybe even translated version of the law in Bengali, it's my, my, my first language. So in that way, yeah, uh, I mean, um, uh, taking help of a lawyer is like a, is a last option, but if it could be done in a more systematic way, uh, uh, in that way, I think players would be better advised. Uh, we also uh, do not have uh, sports agents, for example, so, so that uh, the interest of, interest of the players are not really very well looked after. Yeah. And great. Uh, how about in Switzerland? Uh, in, in Switzerland, does an athlete have a lawyer or like a legal team to consult? Uh, I mean, how does it work, Mr. Boss? Don't really know where where they're going and just they're just following the instructions of for, for example the the Olymp the Swiss uh, Swiss Olympic Committee for example who pro provides them some guidance or or any other Swiss uh, anti-doping agency but often those athletes that I've known maybe not the top athletes being taken apart I'm sure Roger Federer is well advised but most of them um, don't really know and for example taking not not really on a, on the legal point of view but on the medical point of view they're pretty much or often uh, left alone uh, as regards the medication, the drugs, how they, if they affect themselves and, and to, to properly understand the, the prohibited list of WADA is, is quite a challenge for them. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I think this question is particularly interesting. And, and how about in Hong Kong? So, um, Mr. Uh, 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 Mr. Sun, uh, uh, Seto, Seto Wai Sun, how about in, in Hong Kong? How does it work? Well, uh, um, I, I'm not actually in the area, so I, I, I'm, not uh, I'm not sure I could uh, uh, usefully contribute to the discussion. Um, but surely, I think uh, uh, the rules itself, um, I think uh, as China is getting actually uh, more actively in the international arena, I think um, making those rules and how uh, China should participate, uh, uh, how it could more actively participate in making those rules and in actually uh, handling those uh, arbitrations, I think uh, should give us more uh, food for thought. Thank you very much. So, um, uh, so we, we don't have much time left, uh, but uh, we, we will continue. Uh, uh, we will maybe have 20 or 30 minutes for a little later. So, um, just uh, <laughs> so next, uh, please uh, allow me to uh, welcome uh, uh, one of the uh, the, uh, the the earliest person who participated in the uh, sports arbitration from 1988, where the CAS uh, established, uh, Mr. Jean uh, uh, Jean Pierre Mohant. Uh, he's going to discussing about non-analytical anti-doping rule violations. So, um, Mr. Jean-Pierre Morin specialized in corporate and sports law. He acts as a counsel for International Sports Federation, uh, which is the Olympic Committee IOC, and major event organizers. His services regularly required in international arbitration proceedings, including before the Court of Arbitration for Sport, uh, CAS. Uh, he has served in Baker McKenzie, New York and Geneva. I am G as a lawyer and a counsel. He is currently a partner at Kahat Kahos, 
in Lausanne. Uh, and uh, we also made a video uh, interview uh, regarding um, in, in Jean-Pierre Mohant. Uh, particularly, I found it's, uh, it's difficult to pronounce the, uh, the, the law firm uh, he, he's currently working on, and maybe he can start in by uh, sharing uh, how, do, how does the law firm pronounce. Thank you very much. Uh, and the floor is yours, Mr. Jean. <laughs> Okay, uh, I am. I'm trying to share my screen. Is it? Is it? Is it? Is it done? Or is it? Do you see it? Or how? How do you see? It's okay. So, uh, well, I am effectively. Uh, I have been active in sports law since. Uh, no, I'm getting old. Uh, Thirty years, and I started as a. I started by by mere chance, uh, being an associate at Baker McKenzie Geneva, serving a client which then asked me to, to, to join as a legal director and then associate operational director for, for, for five years. It was uh, Mark Beaver Development and then it became IMG Switzerland. It was bought by IMG Switzerland. And then I, I went back to private practice and then I pretty much uh, specialized in both sponsoring first and then I was heavily, um, I, I used the, the um, the, the Court of Arbitration for Sport, I think, as the first one to arbitrate non, let's say, non-technical sports matters, including sponsoring contract, because I found it was at the time a very handy and economical way of, uh, of, uh, of handling, um, uh, let's say, sports-related commercial matters, because that was my main interest at that time. And then I moved uh, and I became uh, highly specialized in doping, especially in very technical cases uh, where I, I supported Then I was completely on the institutional side uh, from the start of my career. I'd, I'd, I mean, the, the life chose for me and I was on this side of the fence. And um, I, I specialized in notably highly technical cases and uh, and then I ended up. I mean, the last uh, my my last uh, my last years have been haunted by the Russian cases, which I which I handled on behalf of the IOC. And um, in FINA, also I have a have a 20, 25 years career as the let's say reference uh, counsel for FINA in all doping matters which uh, brought me in the Sun Young case on the first instant, and then I, I left the case for a conflict of interest matters. And um, that is why I will be very reserved on, on appreciation of the case itself, but uh, it doesn't prevent me to, to give some uh, general uh, opinion. So I also served 20 years as an arbitrator at the CAS, and uh, then I, I quit when it became impossible to be both uh, counsel and uh, an arbitrator in 2009. But uh, I was also one of the co-writer of the rules of the original actual rules, which were actually established in 94 and then several times amended, but the basis was established then in a, in a redaction committee to which I belong. So, I mean, to make a long story short, I mean, sports law become my, became my, my legal life for 30 years. I'm not sure I would have chosen that, but it was chosen for me and it ended up like this. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I don't want to be long on the... We, we, I thought we would have a five, five minutes uh, presentation and then have a discussion. So, I mean, I chose to have a very specific... Uh, uh, topic because otherwise it would be it would be too long and um, uh, I chose the, the one which which I think had some importance in this case because it it also touches on the on the on the evidence rules and it's the difference between so-called analytical and non-analytical um, violation um, I mean the typical analytical violation is really the presence of prohibited substance according to 2-1 WADA code. And then you have, of course, the implementation in this case in the doping control rules. Um, here, I, I would just like to, to mention that there is a certain amount of unclarity about the application of the WADA code because very often it is meant as if the code would directly apply. Technically, normally, it's not the case, and Mr. Boss aptly uh, described it. The 
applicable rules are the FINA doping control rules. However, they implement within FINA, which has the obligation as a signatory of, of the code to do that, they implement at FINA's level the content of the code. So, I mean, the, there is a, let's say, 90% of the code becomes, uh, becomes effectively the rules applied by all sports federations. And this includes one of the questions you mentioned, that is uh, the use of the, of the CAS. The use of the CAS as, this, as an appeal, as the appeal um, uh, entity, is, is, um, is compulsory. That is, there is no alternative for international uh, doping cases, at least, they all have to, if they are appealed, end up in front of the, of the CES and nowhere else. One may discuss whether this is uh, very difficult, uh, with, this is good or right. I, I just want to mention one thing. Uh, there, the CES is certainly not an ideal solution. The question is whether, is not whether it is an ideal solution, is whether there could be a, best, a better one. And there I have my doubts because it's not easy to have, a, it's, it's necessary to have a kind of a, of, a, of unified solution with a certain not complete coherence in the decision. And in this respect, this brings me to the idea that the fact that first it is, um, it is a, you have to go to the CAS and not to, to national court. I think for me, it's the only solution because we see, and I have seen that in my practice, that with all due respect, national courts, quite apart from having probably different uh, legal approach, will have different concept of protecting or not protecting their own athletes. And uh, this was, uh, I mean, the, the, the Puerto case is a, good, is a good case. It was, I mean, the door of, to, to access the evidence in the Puerto case was closed and then open, was closed by the courts, protecting their own athlete, then slightly opened by one judge and then reclosed thereafter and then reopened in the, in the end when it served no purpose. So, you know, national courts are not the appropriate uh, jurisdiction to deal with international sport because there are too many competition between the, unfortunately, personally, I think it's wrong, but I mean, there are too many national issues behind sport to, 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 to let the, the, the decision at national level. So the concept of, an, let's say, neutral in, international court uh, having jurisdiction and there the Swiss, Swiss law is offering some options and possibilities which uh, one can find too broad or too narrow, whatever, but I mean it's, it's a possibility and I think I, I have tr I struggled to think of a better one. Now there are certainly improvements which can be made in the, um, in the CS still, but the concept of having a completely open list is probably not a good one either because Again, you need to have a certain unity of doctrine. Uh, then how the, the, the potential athlete representative are chosen is another matter. It could be addressed and, and, and worked on. Uh, the problem with the athlete is to find who are the representative of the athletes and uh, who, who will be the, the ones who elect uh, the athlete representative in a, in, a, in a way which represents not only the athlete which are concerned by the anti-doping, but the ones which are very often sometimes forgotten in proceedings is all the others. Because it's very nice to protect the athlete's rights, but the athlete's rights include the right to compete in a, as much as possible, doping-free environment. And what I have seen in my experience, uh, by the way, is that very often when you speak with athletes, they are more, let's put it that way, strict than we are in considering the consequences of doping. And they, I mean, it, in the Russian case, it was almost, uh, it was very obvious. And I think sometimes even too, went too far, but the athletes 
wanted to have the Russian athletes being kicked out because they felt they are not competed under fair condition. And I'm not commenting on that, but it's a, it's a fact. The more strict, the, the, the call for the strictest actions came from the athlete. And even to, to, the, to, the, to, to the extent that it pushed the IOC to things which would not have been absolutely necessary, like uh, applying to the Supreme Court, whilst there was obviously, when you think of the ground, very, 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 very low chances to have a reversal of the, of the, of the decision which were favorable to the, to the Russian athletes. So, uh, voila, that, that's just a general policy comment. Now, I mean, just to, my, to the team, and I, I just want to the topic I wanted to address very quickly. I mean, you have the technical uh, doping, um, uh, doping violation, and effectively, uh, what I have to say is that the, the, the whole system is more or less conceived with this principle definition of the anti-doping violation in mind, which makes it sometimes very difficult to, I mean, more difficult to handle non-analytical cases. Uh, and, um, and why so? Maybe just a comment. I mean, sometimes it is said, okay, the rule of evidence are very tough on athletes, which is correct. The problem is that if you want to involve uh, in the rule of evidence as they stand, the, uh, something which would go beyond a, let's say, the evidence of an objective fact, which is, for example, the presence or not the presence in a, in a, doping, in a doping sample, in a sample, it becomes very, very difficult for private organization, be, be them as powerful as they are, to get to the evidence. And, um, uh, as a basic rule, we'll just come back to the evidence rules be before. But I mean, at the beginning, I mean, the, the words in, in dubio pro reo was coming back. But if you would uh, apply that and apply it to the intent, for example, then it would be impossible for a non state authority to get to any meaningful result in the, in the anti doping fight. So there is, um, that is why. A and sometimes it's miscommunicated also. The anti-doping rule system is based on, a, on the duty of the athletes to prevent any elements linked with doping, meaning any trace of a doping substance to enter their body. And this puts an heavy, I, I do realize, a very heavy uh, duty on the athletes, but it's the only way it can work, otherwise, you, you, because you will, you will never know, or let's say, let's put it better that way. It depends. If you have hippo, then there is no sensible reason why you would find hippo in an athlete body. But with almost all the other substances, you, you, would, have, uh, you would have possibility of explanations, starting with uh, contamination, which could explain that you find, you detect a substance in a sample. And you can never draw any conclusion from a punctual analytical result because you, it can be either contamination, for example, to, to address that example, or it could be the end of the excretion curve. So, I mean, for example, the quantity found in the sample is absolutely meaningless. Uh, because you, 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 you are just testing at one time. Voila. Sorry, I mean, I, I've been going uh, away from my uh, sample. So just to, to address, we have the analytical ADRVs, we have the non-analytical ADRVs, and there I have done a, a second uh, distinction because you have the nearly analytical uh, ADRVs in 2.2, which instead of presence of the substance, which is established by, by an analytical process, goes on use. But sometimes, um, since this 2-2 WADA code covers the methods and not the use, for example, EPO is considered as a, as a method. And it's still based on the analytical basis. The, um, 
Tutu is also applicable to the athlete biological passport. And here again, it's partly an analytical and partly, an, let's say, um, uh, an expert-based uh, appreciative evaluation, which concludes that a violation was established or not. So we are still at, at, uh, at the limit of an analytical cases. But then Tutu also includes typically non-analytical um, uh, non-analytical uh, violation. And one of them, in my view, quite strangely, because I never understood why they put uh, some part of tampering on the 2.2 uh, via the uh, prohibited list M2, which lists tampering, adulteration of the samples on the 2.2 WADA code and not 2.5 WADA code. I, I don't know exactly why the, this was done. I could never obtain a, a clear explanation, but that's it. For, for example, the adulteration of samples, typically the, um, for example, the substitution of, in, of urine in the, um, in, the, in the sample, which occurred in the, in the Russian case, would fall rather under 2.2, uh, more than under 2.5. And then you have the, let's say, the, 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 the clearly non-analytical idea of these and uh, two, three, two, four, two, five, I, I think we heard the whereabouts failures, which were explained. Then you have the refusal or the evading. And this is the typical, the one which is in, in, the, in, the, um, which is in the center of the Sun Yang uh, matter with 2.5, which is also uh, obstruction of the collection process when they do not fall under 2.2. And uh, we have noted in that 2.5 co covers witness intimidation. I have said what I already, what I saw that it was a difficult one because typically I, I'm not sure whether it could be handled by the, by the decision making authorities, especially at appeal level, or if this should not, when established, uh, lead to a separate uh, and independent um, uh, anti-doping rule violation proceedings with also the possibility that it would mean that it would be already a multiple violation. And this is a question which remains unanswered and I think it, it will be, it probably will remain unanswered for quite a while. Then you have the, let's say, the, the circumstantial uh, violation, possession, trafficking, um, administration of a uh, prohibited substance, this concern more, let's say, non, non, normally not the athlete, also an athlete can, can be also an administrator in, this, in that sense. Complicity with a very, very wide um, um, uh, interpretation of complicity in one of the, uh, one of the, the first case uh, which involved, um, which, 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 uh, which occurred at the Olympic Games in 2006 in, uh, in Torino, if you remember. So they, they were, they applied complicity against all the, the athletes for the violation committed by the other, which I, again, I mean, I found very, a very, very broad interpretation and it was not followed by in the Russian case, by the way. And then forbidden in, uh, association, is when an athlete uh, associate with, with medical personnel supporting, uh, which it's the Puerto environment, if you want. Um, if we go to the, and again, very quickly, um, the difference, I think one major difference between the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the analytical and let's say, broadly speaking, non-analytical cases, is the evidence. And just to remind you that the general rule of evidence is that the basis of the IDRV must be established to the so-called comfortable satisfaction uh, of the panel, which is something in between uh, a classical, um, a classical civil, civil law uh, standard, which is balance of probability. So, if you have two solutions, the ones which marginally appears as more probable would be would be would be uh, would be chosen. Comfortable satisfaction implies that the 
panel must have a certain level of comfort in reaching that uh, solution. Exactly what it means, I mean, in practice, frankly, it's, it's, a very, it's a very tough, it's a very tough question because in the end, this addresses the, the conviction of the panel and if they are, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a problem. I mean, it's, it's a problem to, to draw a distinction. And, and if, you, if you go, oh, I lost my, let me, voila, oh, sorry, I lost my, I don't know what happens here. Anyway, I lost my, my presentation, so I don't, I don't see it anymore. I, let I me think see. you can click more once, click more one uh, to the, there is ah, a voila, voila, there. voila, okay. Sorry, and I am not, uh, I'm not, not yet uh, a specialist. Um, one, one, in, one important aspect here uh, is that, an important difference is, is that the analytical aspects which are mainly the aspects which are handled by the laboratory are covered by a presumption in favor of the elements, let's say covered by the laboratory process and the analysis. When you moved on a non-analytical case, this becomes irrelevant because you are not in the laboratory precisely. And therefore there is no, there is no uh, strong presumption for non-analytical uh, aspects. And, one aspect which I think is a, is, a, is, a, is a particular one is effectively in certain environment, and this was very strong in Russia, and pardon to my Chinese colleague, but it was also relevant in this, in this Chinese environment because there was, there, I mean, the, there was very high level discontent about the fact that Sun Yang was implicated. And uh, for a Chinese citizen, um, to, to, to come forth and to testify against the national hero is something which is not necessarily easy. And uh, it, it, I mean, I, there was no, to my, to my understanding, there was, no, uh, there was no available direct evidence of, um, of, uh, of, uh, of, um, of pressure, but uh, you just put you in the shoes of a DCO who has to say, uh, uh, my, my, my witness statement is maybe going to send out uh, Mr. Young for uh, eight years. Well, I mean, I, I, and then it, it raises the question which was uh, addressed by the, by the panel in a rather differentiated manner of the protection of the witnesses which were willing to come forward. Uh, because the arbitration court has no power to, to, to order. I mean, if somebody doesn't want to come, it, does, it doesn't come. And in this case, I think, I, I'm not quite sure because I did not uh, reread uh, recently the, I mean, I know what happened in first instance. We, we had only one witness coming forth out of three. So, voila. But that, and in particular in the rules, there was no preference to the DCO uh, witness statement. What is very important is, let's say in the process, when something goes wrong, I think the lesson to be learned is that you must document what happens contemporaneously. And here we had some contemporaneous evidence, but I think the, the stronger evidence will be a contemporaneous report, communication, which translate what was going on. And, uh, this was uh, important in this case. Uh, voila, so in terms of evidence, the, the, the result is that based on the rules, there is no specific um, added value to the DCO witness statement, except that, of course, as they are, especially they are not uh, assermented what we say. So, I mean, they, formally speaking, they have no, they have no uh, more value than the, let's say, athlete's entourage. But as I experienced, and I mentioned this Croatian case, I mean, the athlete's entourage has the tendency to bring any, um, any supportive witness statement they can. And um, so it's, it's difficult because, I mean, the, it's, 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 it's up to the panel to evaluate the, the evidence. And this is a principle under Swiss law. And then it depends on the, on the circumstances of the case. 
Uh, another uh, distinction between analytical and non-analytical, and I will stop with that, is that uh, when, you, when you start in an analytical case, you always are linked with the collection process. So it clearly says who is in charge, because the, the, in this case, FINA ordered the collection, so FINA has the result management jurisdiction. In non-analytical cases, also in, in this environment, Sun Yang, it was also clear because it was again FINA, clearly. Sometimes it's, it's not so clear and I, I can uh, uh, cite uh, an example is the, you know, the, the, Thai, the Thai girl who, who, who made, um, who made uh, confessions on TV that uh, she had been doping during a period covering notably the, the Olympic Games, but not only. And in these cases, it's more difficult to say who, has, who is in charge. And uh, the code solution at this stage is a, is a very formal one. It says, the first ADO, for, my, for me, implicitly, who has a connection with the case, who starts the process as the jurisdiction to conduct the proceedings. Voilà. And this was, I mean, I, I don't want to go further on, um, on, uh, on, on, on my topic because already I spoke too long having expanded on other matters. But uh, I, I think it's better now if we can have a, a discussion, otherwise we will exhaust, uh, it will exhaust the time by ex cathedra. Voilà. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Jean. And uh, it's a great, uh, great perspective regarding the uh, analytical and non-analytical. Maybe for the Chinese uh, lawyers, they're not very familiar how to define the analytical and non-analytical. Can you provide a uh, brief, um, uh, brief definition? And also, in, in the Sun Yang's case, or in the non-analytical cases, uh, the um, the threshold of evidence is should be lower than the analytical cases. Uh, is that right, or there are some general exceptions to that? I, I didn't say. I mean, first of all, analytical is really when your when your violation is defined as being the result of an analysis of a sample, for example. You find uh, the solution, and stricto sensu, it's only for prohibited substance under two one. In a more extensive manner, it's also for EPO cases, ABP cases, because also there it's, an, it's first, it's for the EPO clearly an analytical result, and for the APB an anal analytical results interpreted by expert panel, but it refers to, let's say, an objective result, and you say, okay, this result is what it is, and it's on this result that we are basing the violation. Non-analytical cases are based on behavioral uh, elements like, uh, well, not, part not uh, collaborating to the process, uh, obstructing the process, uh, uh, keeping, uh, keeping uh, prohibited substance in your, in, your, uh, in your storage room, et cetera, or in your car, et cetera, et cetera, or administering administrating um, a prohibited substance, but it did, does not depend on an analytical laboratory result, if you want. That's what I would, uh, how I would uh, define it. And I mean, there is no, in, in, as a matter of fact, I mean, the, the burden of proof is exactly the same, except that for the analytical content, you have a presumption which does not apply for uh, a validity, which does not apply uh, for the other elements. For the other elements, you just work with the general rules. You have to be satisfied that it occurred and then comfortably satisfied. And then in theory, I mean, the, the athlete could come with a slightly lower uh, threshold and say, because of this element that I'm now establishing at a slightly lower of threshold of burden of proof, but again, I mean, what does it mean? I'm not sure. I have been an arbitrator myself and I, during 20 years, but I'm not sure how I, how I would do the, the exact distinction of this difference between comfortable satisfaction and balance of probability. Uh, also, technically it exists, but in reality, I'm not so sure. Um, uh, then, voila, that, that's the way, it's, but it's the, it's the same evidence basic rule without the presumption. Voila. I think Mr. Lucien has a question. May I say something? May I say something to that? I remember um, 
the Bear Palu case where we, we uh, were acting and we could win the case. Uh, the Bear Palu case, there was no uh, doping substance found in the body. It was about uh, yeah, blood values. And uh, there we could convince the panel that there must be 99.9 satisfaction, 99.9 proof that he has doped. You you see, uh, it is not a positive test. As long as there is no positive test, the burden of proof must be as high as possible. It's the same. It, it must be the same burden of proof if, if they say you are the child, you are the father of this child. In the beginning, when there was no DNA test, uh, uh, which is now very, very clear, it had to be always 99.9%. And it is not, it should be the same here, and it was the same. In, in the Verpulu case. So I think uh, there is a difference and there must be a difference. I would politely disagree because, I mean, there are also the Verpalu cases is, is what it is and uh, congratulations to Mr. Baloney. <laughs> but I am not sure it will serve as precedent for the end of times. Uh, the 99% 0.9% is certainly not something which I have ever seen taken back. I mean, I have also, there are also precedent where panels have, have said, I've referred to Indubio Pro Reo, they were contradicted by further panel. In this respect and without, I think we, 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 won't, we won't go in that discussion because it's, uh, but it is clear that the, the, you must never forget that a decision by one panel is a decision by the CAS nominally, but in the end, it's a, it's a one panel decision. And that's a little bit ambiguous I, 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 in the CAS because there are no precedent, no absolute precedent value in one decision. And uh, there is no, there is no uh, let's say temporal uh, time, higher value of the first, uh, let's say, um, uh, panel would decide something, and then this would prevent other panel to to um, uh, to to have a slightly different view. And again, without entering any polemic on this one, I think you have to realize that going forward, panels of the of the CAS may defer to precedents, but don't must not defer to precedent of the CES. And it's, a, it's something which there is a tendency to observe precedence, but in a system of uh, arbitration, which I would describe as being horizontal and, <laughs> and not having a Supreme Court on top, which would say what, what is the leading precedent, it's, there is still a moving ground between one decision which exists and then the next one. It can go, Mr. Valloni, it can go both ways. I mean, I, 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 I assume, but there is no absolute precedential value in, in, a panels, in one panel's decision. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Valloni and Mr. Jean. Um, uh, for, for me, I'm not familiar with the case. If you can type what is the case about and uh, about the, the reference so we can, uh, we can do some homework uh, afterwards. So that will be really, uh, really helpful. Uh, and so um, uh, the, uh, the last letter, uh, we, we have one, uh, uh, we, we discussed about a lot about sports arbitration so far, and uh, now we have become relaxing a little bit, discussing, discovering the co uh, collaboration opportunities uh, between Swiss and Chinese lawyers and, uh, and, uh, and future collaborations, particularly uh, in, um, uh, in, the, uh, in, Shanghai, um, uh, in Shanghai free trade zone. So let me welcome uh, Mr. Fang, uh, Ye Fang. Uh, as you may, uh, uh, he, she is a senior partner of Obai Law Office. Uh, he, she is a, sorry, she is a PhD in law and the senior and the senior partner of Obai Law Offices. Her practice area, including cross-border uh, investment, financing, financing, merger and acquisition, dispute resolution, real estate infrastructure, 
uh, and um, and free trade is on legal services. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Year has provided legal services for a number of banks, um, uh, in, including uh, including a lot of uh, famous clients uh, around the globe. Uh, so uh, time is yours, uh, Mr. Year, and I hope we can uh, uh, we can if, if you have you have 15 minutes. Thank you. I'm very pleasure to be the last speaker. <laughs> can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Uh, yes. We are talking. Uh, we have uh, talked ab about sports law and case Shenyang for a long time. So I ha I will have a brief introduction uh, for Shanghai Free Trade Zone and uh, the legal collaboration here, and that's our uh, future opportunity to cooperate as uh, legal providers. Uh, in uh, and the yeah the contents will be uh, including the three parts. So when I attend uh, the international uh, bar association annual meeting, I met a lot of uh, uh, international professionals. Uh, I was always uh, asked uh, by two questions. Oh, you're a counsel of uh, free trade so uh, The first question frequently asked is, is that free? Okay, the second question usually is, uh, what's the legal infrastructure there? So uh, I think uh, that will uh, really influence uh, our legal service here. And uh, you know, China is a <clears throat> fast changing society, including the legal uh, service industry. Uh, uh, some of you might know uh, the free train was launched in uh, September, the end of September 2013. And, and many people will ask uh, why China uh, started doing that. So uh, many years later, people starting to know it's uh, not um, another high tech park, another industry park, not anymore. Uh, they are doing some uh, something new, uh, ex um, exper experiment. Yeah, a, a kind of lab of reform. Uh, that's China usually to do in like the Shenzhen, it's a lab for the, the national reform. Then it will copy it to other places. Um, yeah, mm, so at that time, people say that's the fourth wave of China economy. The first wave is uh, the 40 years ago, uh, China opened and reformed uh, policy. Uh, the second, uh, the second economic wave is 30 years ago. It's a Shanghai Pudo new area. It's the whole land here. Uh, development. That's where we are, and um, our office here. Uh, the the third wave is China join WTO in 2001, and the free trade zone policy along with the. Um, the one belt, one road policy together will be the fourth wave. Okay, yes, yeah, starting from that year, you can see the, the doing business of the world, uh, ranking by the World Bank uh, annual report, uh, China rank uh, uh, starting from 96 until now it's a uh, 31. And Shanghai and Beijing, two cities uh, become uh, the two uh, weight in in this uh, ranking, and there are many uh, index here, and I would like to show uh, the index uh, most related to regulations and laws. That's uh, smart governance, S M A R T. So I like that. Uh, that's uh, very. Um, uh, organized to uh, describe uh, our re reform um, vision of ch China govern governance. Okay, so uh, in the past uh, seven years, uh, China, uh, China free trade zone expanded to different uh, cities or province. Uh, so we have different colors here starting from the red to the green, then yellow area, then the orange area, Hainan, Hainan Free Trade Island. Okay, 
even in Shanghai uh, municipal city, uh, we spent uh, from the the first um, part uh, into an, another um, 3.2.0 uh, uh, to 3.0 version. Uh, included uh, some pre-existing industry of uh, Zhangjiang high-tech industry, Lu Jiazui financial uh, um, area, Zhangjiang high-tech industry park, and uh, the Jinqiao um, export industry park. Okay, so now we are here. Uh, last year, uh, we, we start launching uh, the new area of uh, Shanghai Free Trade Zone. You can see the, uh, the blue line. The blue line is uh, a river, the North River named Da Zhi River. The Western River is Jinghuigang River. So why uh, Shanghai use this uh, two river as the border of new area? Uh, because Shanghai wanna, uh, wanna uh, enjoy the Hainan uh, Island policy. So he has to make two rivers as border. So make it looks like uh, an island. So he can, can try some um, more um, uh, profitable policies and reform here. Okay. So in this area, uh, the, the vision of this area for the future 15 years or uh, 16 years, that will uh, be 2035. Uh, to, uh, till, uh, that year, uh, the goal of, of this area, the GDP uh, will uh, want us um, meet the uh, one trillion. Uh, one trillion RMB. That that equals half Singapore RMB uh, GDP, and the entire GDP of current Pudong area. So um, the the vision of this uh, 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 new land um, is to create a new Pudong area. And the population there uh, is now car uh, currently the population is. Uh, Six uh, ninety thousand population, and the the future uh, fifteen to sixteen years that will meet two million and five hundred thousand. Okay, so uh, you may know some of the projects here already. The like Tesla, Tesla new manufacturer uh, already built, uh, complete uh, the build and the cars sold. And you may uh, know a lot of uh, news uh, of Tesla here. Okay, so um, yeah, that's something related to the arbitration business. So before this, uh, the Shanghai uh, trade uh, free trade zone new area, uh, there are already uh, some famous arbitration center already set up their rep office here in the prior. Uh, policy of free trade zone, but now they can set up their um, not only rep office, but also the organization, uh, the operation, uh, operation office here. That means um, it can not only uh, to do some liaison works, but also to uh, to do their business here, to. Um, and even more, uh, starting from uh, January 1st, this year, 2020, uh, they, um, the Shanghai measures uh, is active now. So it, the, the list of applications not uh, released now, uh, but um, I can uh, imagine there are some of uh, applicants already and um, we will have, uh, we will know the news soon. Okay, oh, that's the application process. Yeah, so uh, we welcome uh, more and more um, uh, famous um, pre-existing um, arbitration institute setting up their business here. 
that will help a uh, free trade zone uh, to um, join the international society. Okay, uh, this is also the application process. Okay, that's the, the case, uh, Shanghai. Yeah, I, I think you already know there are six cases uh, here, uh, heard here. So I just um, put the information for you. And one of our uh, Albright uh, formal partner, uh, uh, Mr. Professor, we call, we call him Professor Chen. Uh, he, he is a professor and also a senior partner uh, here, but uh, uh, several years um, later, he, he uh, several years ago, he retired. He used to be uh, the arbitrator of, of Shanghai case. Okay, so we do have some um, policies here in um, free trade zone, the new area and the, the, the uh, pre-existing area of um, uh, foreign law firms and local Chinese law firms association. And we, uh, I post uh, like seven association cases here already. See, Bakeman can see, Hogan Lovers, Esther, Linklater, uh, very many big names here. And some of them, they uh, associated with a smaller, a very small law firm. Uh, they have already established a uh, uh, corpor corporation uh, before, and some of the local uh, firm, it's not, not small, they're very big, such as uh, the number two in Thai law firm, it's uh, in Shanghai, it's uh, specializing in shipping um, area. And the, the third, it's a uh, Fujian, um, a fin, fin Findelity law firm, it, it's the biggest uh, law firm in Fujian province. And the fourth one, the uh, Guantao law firm, is very big, a uh, national firm, many uh, branch offices in China. And our firm, Albright, we are uh, also thinking about such kind of uh, association with our strategic partnership, a uh, law firm that's Bird and Bird, a British law firm. Okay. Oh. Next slide. Oh yes, <laughs> yeah. Uh, we recently visited the the new uh, free trains of area, the administration uh, office, and uh, our, it's our delegation visiting. Uh, we are uh, talking about the is there any some some new uh, policies uh, in this area for the legal uh, service cooperation. Okay. Okay, thank you. Do you have any questions for me? Hello? I mean, yes, yes, I have, Jean-Pierre, I have a question for you. Um, there are two, I mean, here I'm putting my hat as a, a Swiss Arbitration Association board member. And um, I, I considered the, the following proposition. I mean, we are, I mean, in, in our association, we are discussing international issues. And now China and we, we in our sports, narrow sports discussion, we, we mentioned that sometimes there is an imbalance of the rules towards, geared towards, let's say, the white community. And I, I think in international uh, issues, there is, I mean, the, the most applied rules are normally the, the, the Anglo-Saxon rules and the, and the English law, etc. And this creates, let's say, I am not a fan of saying that the law is geared to one party because normally the law is some, something which is neutral. But in the perception, I saw that Swi Switzerland with Swiss law could have maybe a role to play in offering a more balanced solution, alternative solution for the Chinese parties especially. Because first, it's a civil law, and I understand you, you are a civil law system. So maybe from uh, the perspective of understanding the system, uh, it's easier from a Chinese lawyer to, 
to let's say to to associate with the the, the functioning of a, of a seal law system like Switzerland, and secondly because let's say the, the commercial elements of Swiss law are very stable. I mean, they, our code of obligation is a very old law which has not moved for uh, which is not moving every day, unlike uh, certain laws and especially also laws which are based on strongly based on precedent. But if I take another law like French law where they they do a law for any possible issue, so it's it's a very difficult environment to com to comprehend to understand. And I thought that Swiss law could have could be an offer an offer for, let's say, building up a basis on which Chinese versus other international parties could be more at ease to proceed than just uh, applying the Anglo-Saxon standards where only the Anglo-Saxon, let's say, firms are, are, are at ease. And uh, in this respect, uh, I was very interested by your uh, by your by your presentation, I was wondering suddenly whether um, the, the, the chambers of commerce were administrating the Swiss rules, but more fundamentally, maybe the the, the association a body like the Swiss Arbitration Association could maybe develop concretely such an offering on site in in your free free zone uh, areas, because. How would it be perceived from China? Sorry, it's a long question. Voila. Yeah, I think your question is, is related to uh, my first, uh, uh, I first mentioned I was uh, free, frequently asked two questions. The first one, is it free? Or the second one is, uh, uh, what's the legal infrastructure? I think we, we really, th think about in the new free trade zone here, because uh, compared with like Dubai, uh, Kazakhstan, uh, um, Qatar, and now even Kazakhstan, they are establishing their free trade zone based on common law system, not their, their own law, not the local law. They establish their, uh, the, the, their court and the entire system based on common law. Uh, so, we are looking for this, uh, how they works uh, there in, uh, in that free trade zone, how it helped the major player play. Um, yeah, uh, but you know, uh, in Chinese history, we have, uh, we have some bad feelings about uh, foreign, foreign law application, especially in the, in the opium um, age open war age, Shanghai has the like foreign jurisdiction territory, uh, that will make our uh, government nervous. Uh, um, yeah, so I think uh, you really uh, raise um, a, an alternative resolution <laughs> that is um, Switzerland law application. Yeah, I think we, uh, we are doing it uh, um, because I, I used to be a teacher of a, a party school named um, China Executive Leadership Academy. Um, it's a, a national um, officials uh, training school. Um, at that time, uh, I was selected uh, by the central government uh, trained in, in Switzerland, you know, at that time, uh, 2006, uh, 14 years ago. Uh, we are trained uh, by most of them, it's a US-based human resource uh, theory and um, um, yeah, textbook sometimes. Uh, but uh, at that time, I think about this be because Switzerland is a, a neutral country. So that, is, that help our um, two systems uh, to trust each other. And uh, here we are doing some research for um, Shanghai court system um, to how to uh, to try to see how can we reform um, like to formulate a new kind of um, legal infrastructure in new area of new free trade zone. So I, I really think you need come to talk about uh, your idea to our 
uh, decision makers, lawmakers. And uh, this area has their own power of lawmaker from central um, government. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Amy. Uh, is there any questions? Um, if not, uh, then um, I would like to present of Swiss Chinese Law Association. Uh, I, I firstly wish, uh, uh, would like to thank you for, uh, for your time uh, here. I, I know some colleagues, because of time, they, they wrote to me that uh, they cannot uh, participate because we, we delayed. So uh, we will we'll share the videos to all the, with all the colleagues uh, and all, also the PowerPoint uh, to all the colleagues because for, uh, for uh, uh, who, uh, who registered this conference. Uh, and the secondly, uh, which is most importantly, I wish you all, um, and your family stay in health and uh, uh, it's a difficult time and uh, um, uh, and it is important to wear a mask. Uh, I mean, I'm, I, I personally don't agree with the CDC and in China and Hong Kong, uh, Hong Kong SAR and the Singapore, uh, the, all the guidelines were uh, were about wearing a mask. I, I I mean, wearing a mask really protective uh, of the of the issues of the of the coronavirus. And the thirdly, uh, as um, uh, it's like I, I have to apologize for those people we don't have time to introduce yourself. And uh, uh, but you have the uh, email address of every person, so you're welcome to send uh, send some. Uh, send some uh, uh, images and uh, uh, and emails, coordinations uh, and uh, introductions, uh, whatever you found interesting to other colleagues. Uh, <laughs> I guess most of the colleagues are at home and like me, so uh, we, we would I we would like love to read some uh, some uh, some your feedback, emails, whatever. And more importantly, uh, we, 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 as as a tradition, as a, what what we do is we have come up with a report of this uh, this meeting. And I urge, if you can, write a brief summary of what do you think this case is, what do you like, uh, which part would you would you like to be particularly mentioned, uh, so we can contribute this report as to share uh, share for all the colleagues because we can continue this discussion uh, not only with this three hours meeting. So, so that that is all. And uh, and uh, thank you, uh, thank you all, all, all um, thank you for you all, and uh, uh, wish your and your family great health. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Keep in touch. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.